Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to the third Collective Intelligence Block Party. I'm Jamin Shively, here with my colleague and friend, Nolan. Great to see you, Nolan. Good to be here. Happy to be joined by our buddy, Miles, in Canada. Good morning, Miles. And Emery, good morning. I know you're on mute right now, and it looks like you got some cool stuff going on with the background of your video. It looks like we can see shadows of you. So, awesome. Good to be here. Mm -hmm. Third block party, ready to go. Beautiful, awesome memory, thank you. Well, today, um, after, we're just gonna kinda hang out for a bit here for the first hour and uh, talk about some general topics related to the block party to the various urgencies that we have led by the urgency to cool the planet to save life on earth and uh, what our overall approach is here at the block party. Why do we do a block party every single week for 24 hours? Right now, it's a couple of minutes after six o'clock in the morning, Pacific time. Uh, we're broadcasting from uh, Whidbey Island, Washington, and so far on the on the previous two block parties, we've been joined by people from nine different countries around the world, which has been exciting, and we want that to grow to all countries. Um, um, so for now, I'd like to just kind of, well, first of all, I've checked in. If anyone else would like to check in and say hello, hello world. And tell us about how sure, you... I'll check in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, how's my audio? Because I'm not using Perfect. the microphone. Perfect. Yeah, per oh, good. Perfect. Excellent. So, um, hi, everybody. My name's Miles Flegg. I'm up here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, also known as Mochkinstis, or you can say you can use sign language and point to the elbow because Calgary is at the confluence of two rivers, the Bow River and the Elbow River. So um, uh, this is uh, just, I always like to acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 7 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Initsitapi, more commonly known as the Blackfoot people. And it's also home to the Siksika, the Pikani, the Kainai, the Tutina, and the Ayaho Nakoda. So uh, we also ha have Métis people who are people who have both ancestries of settlers and indigenous people. So um, I'll talk more about that because I had a really interesting confluence of occurrences that ended up having me attending a meeting presented by or a presentation given by doctor or professor, well he is a, I believe an honorary doctor, uh, Leroy Little Bear, who I've talked about in the past. And it was just a coincidence that I happened to find out that he was giving this presentation. And uh, lo and behold, I next thing I knew I was there listening to him talk again. And it's really mind bending. Um, so I'll share more about that. But anyway, nice to be here back at the block party. I'm amazed that these two fellows can put this on, host a party for 24 hours and not lose their mind or fall asleep in the middle of it. So way to go, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Miles. On the first block party, I started to doze off a little bit <laughs> a couple of times, <laughs> but hung in there. Um, and thank you for that acknowledgement. All righty. Well, we're just Checking in right now. If anyone else would like to check in, feel free. <clears throat> there is never any pressure to speak on the block party. So no one is ever put on the spot. Um, speaking is always optional. So just jump in if you feel like it. And if not, no problem. Hey, Jamin. Miles. Yes, Emery. Good morning. Last week, last week ended pretty abruptly. Last last week's block party. Oh well, so I'm 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 glad you I'm glad you mentioned that. The thing is, um, 
here's what happens and here's what happened and what will probably happen again today is that <clears throat> Zoom apparently after 24 hours of continuous video conference, um, apparently they automatically cut you off, automatically end the meeting. But then you can rejoin the same meeting with the same link. It's just kind of like an automatic shut off, but then you can turn it back on right away. So if anyone gets cut off near the end, like in the last hour or so, which is predictable at this point, uh, please just go back to the same link that you joined with originally and you can rejoin. It may take us maximum a couple minutes to rejoin ourselves and get back rolling. So I apologize for that, uh, Emery. And uh, we'll be, we're make, we've made a note to let everybody know about an hour before the end <laughs> that that may happen, <laughs> will probably happen. It was uh, quite interesting, though. Uh, I real I realized that uh, later on, and when I when I decided, hey, let me try that link. Let me try the link again, and uh, I I pasted the link and got back in, and there was nobody there, nobody in the room uh, at that point, and I said, wow, I'm all alone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I I thought that was kind of interesting that. <clears throat> We do have that possibility that the link, the link stays open. But uh, I mean, I think it's only for a, a limited time, though. And then, and then you're you're uh, you're ended automatically because you're not you don't have the, the same privileges that that you do, the account holder. So you know, but you're still given a, a fair block of time there that. You could invite other people if if you choose uh, or whatever. <laughs> so think about that. Could be uh, useful. Yeah. Well, Zoom um, is free to use. There's you can have a free account and set up Zoom video conferences whenever you want. We have a paid account, which enables us to go for much longer and have more participants and all that. Um, but video conferencing generally has really opened up the possibilities for collective intelligence to manifest. And that's, you know, one of our big missions here, um, both at Radish and just generally in the world, is that we manifest a, collect, a form of collective superintelligence, which um, we talk about a fair amount here at the block party. Um, but it's particularly urgent right now when there are things that so obviously and so urgently need to be done to save life on earth, and yet we're not doing it. Why not? <clears throat> and that's a, that's a central question that um, really gets to the heart of collective superintelligence. Um, and there's as many answers to that question as there are people on the planet. Um, but for me, the answers cluster around the fact that we were born and conditioned into a modality of life that's both very social and which has... Um, the authority of government kind of built into it, right? When we're born into this world, or at least, you know, in the last, going back perhaps the last couple hundred years or so, but increasingly in recent years, if you're born into this world as a human being, you're born with an awareness that there's this big thing called governments and all the governments around the world coordinate and they're the ones who are basically in charge, right? And um, so uh, a lot of metaphors have been used for that, but let's just take the nanny state mentality as one. Um, we are conditioned uh, to uh, respect and obey 
uh, these authority figures. And uh, the basic contract that we were essentially conditioned into, though if you make it explicit, is look, as long as you obey these governments and do your fair share, pay your taxes, vote every four years or whatever, they will take care of you. If your house catches on fire, boom, within a couple of minutes, the fire department will be there putting it out. You know, if you get sick or have a heart attack, an ambulance will come, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just sort of, you know, the, the impression that we're born into or the paradigm that we're born into is that there's this big government that is there to take care of you, <laughs> right? And therefore, when big calamities happen, whether it's a hurricane or a flood or a volcano or whatever, you know, governments step up with emergency services and help out. And so my perspective is that we're so conditioned that government takes care of big things that, you know, we're sort of lulled into this complacency that um, we just have to do our part in society, whatever our job is, right? And let government take care of the big stuff, right? Um, now we are confronted with the very uh, disconcerting fact that the governments of the world do not have this crisis handled by any stretch. In fact, they're looking increasingly incompetent the more that they get together and meet and talk about it, right? It becomes increasingly obvious that um, the people who go to these, like the big international climate conferences or COP whatever meetings in Madrid, Copenhagen, Paris, etc. cetera, um, each attendee there is looking at the interests of their own country. And when I say the interests of their own country, it's even that's not quite accurate because if they were looking out for the interests of their own country, they would go there with a serious um, responsibility and openness to find and implement whatever solutions are required. But instead, they position and negotiate about things like emissions and carbon tax and cap and trade and who knows what else, and they get nowhere, right? It's just this total gridlock. And so what we are doing here with the Collective Intelligence Block Party is creating um, a whole new modality for humanity to come together, to connect, um, to converse, and ultimately the vision is that we will co-create all the solutions that we need as humanity directly working with each other. Les, good morning, how you doing? You're on mute at the moment with these big long uh, Zoom video conferences, we set it up so that muting is automatic initially when a person first enters and then they can unmute. Anyway, feel free to check in and say hello whenever convenient. There's never any pressure to talk here on the block party. Um, so, and we've just been speculating about uh, the nature of this opportunity that we're developing here of collective super intelligence. Yes, Les, jump in. Good to see you. Hi. Yeah, great. Awesome, awesome. Great to see you, great to see everybody. <clears throat> we're excited for another marathon 24 hour collective intelligence block party. Um, All right. You know, and we were we were just talking about you know what this means to us. Um, I've been sharing probably a bit too much, so I'm going to mute myself <laughs> and give others an opportunity to jump in and talk about what collective intel super intelligence means to you and how you see this unfolding. And uh, what are we up to here? What's the big idea? <laughs> Hey guys. Les, do you want to go ahead and talk or 
uh, I'll share after everybody else has had an opportunity to speak. Um, I have, well, I have, sure. <laughs> I, I was just listening to Jeremy um, a little bit. I, I kind of missed some of what he said. But, um, it sounded interesting. Um, uh, the government's, uh, they don't, a lot of them don't seem to like really be interested in uh, the health of the citizens. <laughs> you know, they, they kind of see us as like uh, cows to milk, it seems like. So we, we really need a government that uh, represents uh, our interest and not corporate interest because the government is a, a tool of corporations now and not a, not a tool for um, you know our survival and benefit. And uh, <laughs> when they help the interests of corporations, corporations are all about making a profit. So uh, uh, that's detrimental to everything because it's a uh, it's just continuing to uh, exploit the resources of the planet and use more and more uh, it's like a it's 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 very much like cancer I think <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'll uh, add that for me, the, the problem is the governments indeed are not working for the people. They are indeed working for the corporations, these artificial persons that are created in law and these artificial persons they're machines there's no heart in these corporations um, what i think we have to do though is say okay uh, we recognize this fundamental flaw that corporations are heartless however we it's like we're on the titanic i think you know we've talked about this on the social club before and i suppose some people think let's just abandon ship you know and to the life rafts hopefully the life rafts will get us to shore <clears throat> but my perspective is i think we best stay on the titanic for a bit more and see if we can't salvage it because as much as these corporations, and I have 30 years experience working for them and realized, yeah, they're, they're even, they're more heartless than ever before. I actually had pretty good experience the first three years of my career, quite enjoyed it. Um, but then the heart, whatever heart there was <clears throat> in these, this corporation uh, died from the mid 1980s to when I left it not too long ago for circumstances and reasons are a bit too complicated to get into, but suffice to say, it's about the heartlessness of this corporation, in my opinion. So um, to summarize, we, uh, we have to realize that this, these machines have given us, you know, for example, what we're talking on right now, I'm looking at you through an iPad, we're using Zoom. And Radish.org is, is also a company in the making. Um, and and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how Jamin can create a real true heart at Radish. And, you know, we, we do, I know we've talked about abandoning money and such, but again, it's a, you just can't abandon something unless you've got something else to go to, right? So anyhow, we're in this paradigm and my perspective is we have to try to shape it, um, not just 
jump overboard and think that we can swim to shore because I think that could be more devastating or actually really yeah, have a lot of people end up drowning. Anyway, any thoughts on that? Beautiful. Thank you, Miles. Uh, Emery has had his hand raised. Emery? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, it, it makes sense. Uh, thanks, Miles, for that. Um, I, uh, I think that we have to come to uh, acknowledge the magnitude, the magnitude of the situation that we're in, you know. Um, I mean, I heard uh, Guy uh, this morning, he put out a new video and um, it was related to what's going on with the coronavirus and how, how in fact that is, uh, you know, uh, affecting uh, China and um, the industrial activities that's that are going on, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the industrial activities that are that that China offers to the world, it's enough now, uh, as far as Guy uh, McPherson is saying, to affect global temperature. Again, it's going to be, per, uh, I think what he said was uh, a 1.3 degree. Uh, it could it could be potentially a 1.3 uh, degree increase uh, in a his time frame is explained in the video I think uh, anyone who's interested in in that could uh, could watch his latest video and um, maybe you know we could chime in on this uh, coronavirus and the uh, the impact it's going to have on uh, the industrial uh, civilization here on planet Earth. Very good, Emery Miles. Um, you know, we're just such at such a fascinating moment um, with all these forces happening at once. Uh, Miles, I tend to agree with your general statements about um, it's better not to abandon ship. Uh, you know, the ship obviously being a metaphor for uh, all of our current set of institutions, economy, governance, um, even culture, right? Um, we, you know, we have a culture that, a modern culture, uh, speaking of, um, the people who are not living in the traditional tribal ways, but people who are living in the kind of modern industrial paradigm, all of us included, <clears throat> um, that this whole modern set of living arrangements uh, is what I think you're referring to with the ship, Miles, including governments, government, et cetera, working with government and all that. And um, what uh, Emery just mentioned about the coronavirus and the kind of temporary shutting down of industry, et cetera, is uh, a good example of the kind of catastrophes that in the very short term that we could experience if we don't keep the current system propped up and um, very ironically and paradoxically you have the global dimming effect which says that as long as we keep the engines running there will be enough particulates in the atmosphere to reflect away a portion of the sunlight hitting the planet keeping us artificially cool from that effect alone. Um, so we simply cannot afford to shut down this engine of particulate generation that's keeping us alive until <clears throat> we replace that mirroring effect uh, 
with another substitute form of solar radiation management, which we talk about extensively here on the block party. And in fact, <laughs> we're gonna be talking about that starting in just a little bit here, um, in about uh, 35 minutes or so at seven o'clock Pacific time. We'll talk specifically about SRM, but <clears throat> more generally, um, here's how I sort of think about it is um, all of the institutions that are currently in power uh, and working to whatever degree. Um, uh, they're gonna, here's, I'll just put it on the table. So the way I see it is this collective super intelligence in order to manifest and grow and evolve to become a, an, an incredibly powerful force here on planet Earth <clears throat> does not require at any moment for any existing institutions to stop functioning, right? It kind of creates its own layer of intelligence that can then work with or against any institutions of any kind. So the way I see it very generally working out is that as we uh, grow and evolve collective super intelligence, um, we will be able to work in a very benevolent symbiotic way with governments all around the world um, to help them um, to see what the best path, path forward is. You know, going back over 10 years ago, maybe 12, 13 years ago, um, I started to speculate on, you know, what if there were just like some alien intelligence that would just descend onto planet Earth um, that was just super benevolent, right? And could sit there and observe and observe and observe and start to kind of build a model of everything that's happening here. And if that alien intelligence were orders of magnitude smarter than we are, it would be able to basically understand us um, <clears throat> and understand our institutions, their limitations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and basically come up with a holistic plan for how to get us onto a new track and being so intelligent, this alien superintelligence would also be able to um, figure out kind of all of the, exactly what would need to happen first, second, and third to go from exactly whatever the starting conditions are to wherever we want to get to. And um, it would seek to do this with pure intelligence and communication. So let's say it established communication channels with not only all the governments in the world, but all the media outlets. And it started to propagate a certain meme or a set of memes that got people thinking in a whole new way, right? <clears throat> and um, let's say it popularized some change, whether it's community cafes to end hunger or holistic land management or veganism or SRM or whatever, the alien superintelligence would figure out, you know, what's the easiest domi what are the easiest dominoes to knock over first that can then get other dominoes going? And I think you, you see where I'm going with this is that this alien super intelligence being so much smarter than us <clears throat> would be able to essentially orchestrate us, right? And um, in a very benevolent way. So with that as the original seed of an idea, I think that must have stayed with me um, as in recent years we've developed Radish and the vision of collective super intelligence where we essentially become we operating in this new modality of collective superintelligence, we become like that alien intelligence that descends on earth and starts to orchestrate a, a transformation, not based on money or ownership or traditional means of power and influence, even exploitation, et cetera, um, but just by communicating thinking, processing, modeling, and communicating, 
right? So it's up to us. And I'll build on that. Um, yeah. So for everybody listening, I think I'm perhaps going back three years when I, for whatever reason, somehow thought, oh, maybe I'll try this live streaming out and jump in on a Google Hangout as it was back then. And, and it was called the Social Club that Jamin and Radish were organizing. And, you know, with a lot of fear and trepidation, I pushed the button to um, join in. I think prior to that, I might have experimented a little bit with Periscope. So anyway, uh, what's transpired though is just by having these social exchanges and sharing of information and sharing of inspiration, I have continued on this journey of mine and um, but gathering all these inputs. So uh, one example is by being part of this group, I was inspired to you know, go down and join in on one of the, well, actually, <laughs> I, I, I've been going to the Fridays for Futures, and but even before those were started in Calgary, I, I went down one day by myself to City Hall, and that was only because of the inspiration provided by the Social Club, which connected me to Stuart Scott, who was talking about Greta and actually had been inspirational or instrumental in getting Greta to Katowice, Poland for the COP20, whatever it was. Um, and, and so this was before Greta Thunberg was even known on the world stage uh, very prominently. And so because Jamin, then Stuart Scott, then learning who this Greta is, I thought, oh my God, I've got it. I just, as a boomer, I need to do something, you know, for this next generation. So I went down, and if anybody's interested, um, go to my Twitter handle. I have a few followers. Um, but on my pinned tweet that I pinned is actually a photo I took of my little display in the foyer of the City Hall of Calgary that only lasted for half an hour because they came along and kicked me out. They said, you can't, you can't put up signs. All right, so apparently I was breaking a bylaw, but nevertheless, I did have my sign up for a little bit. Greta Thunberg, you know, Fridays for Future. What does it say? It says, we are climate leaders, so are you. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we need you now. That's quoting Greta Thunberg. Now, I'm going to go down there again today. My plan is I got to put on the backside a block party happening now. And, um, and, and particularly now, because uh, just very recently where I am, there was this ridiculous oil company, the oil well service company, uh, is allegedly had created a sticker. Somebody's created a decal. And I'm not even going to describe it, but it's a, a terrible affront to Greta, Mother Earth, and the Divine Feminine. So all that's doing is it's just inspiring me even more to go back down there today to stand with Greta and to stand with the block party. And, um, you know, whatever it is will transpire. But getting back to um, the, the social club, the block party, the collective intelligence, why it's so important is because it, it spreads the ideas and it generates this, the thinking of us all, these, all these neurons coming together in the block party. And there's no telling what will happen because of it, right? It doesn't have to be, it, it can get, you, you can move from here into more formal arrangements, more formal contracts with each other, and start, you know, creating a company, making mirrors, right? But it can it starts as we've said with a conversation, and that, that that's a wonderful quote of Ralph Nader. It all begins with a conversation, 
I'll wrap up by saying this Dr. Leroy Little Bear that I spoke to, um, he was saying that the Blackfoot metaphysics or the Nitsitapi metaphysics is waiting. So this alien superintelligence is not actually alien, it's a supra intelligence. Supra meaning it's deep inside us. We just have to pull it out and we, the collective intelligence, including this Nietzsche metaphysics that Dr. Leroy Little Bear is talking about, it's just waiting there for us to manifest and bring it forward. And then we actually sh change the shape of government and institutions with it. So we're not going to destroy all that's been created, but we're going to reshape it. So anyway, that's a little bit, I, you know, I could go on a lot longer, but I won't because I don't want to hog the platform here. Thank you. No, not at all. Good stuff, Miles. Really good. Um, could you clarify a little bit about the supra and that which is kind of innate or inside waiting to come out versus something external? <clears throat> okay, so uh, um, as you know, I've said it in the previous block parties, I've been talking, uh, part of a Carl Jung depth psychology reading group, which gets together with Skip Conover, and he, he came up with, well, everything's pulled out of the superintelligence, right? Um, and and he, he came across the word supra intelligence and it's different than super intelligence and it's different than supernatural such as you know god is out there and god is alien or above everything outside of everything supernatural supra s-u-p-r-a is more of god's not out there or creator or as the nitsitapi describe the giver of life their word for god is the giver of life which i think is wow that's that's so amazing um so the giver of life is not external to us the giver of life is internal supra natural and i guess that's from carl jung or wherever he got it from Beautiful. Thank you, Miles. Yeah, I would totally agree. It, it, uh, it is something that's inside of us, even innate, because if you think about, you know, I was talking a little bit ago about how we were born into this paradigm and set of living arrangements and all that. If you think back tens of thousands of years ago, when we were much more in our natural evolutionary state, um, I believe that like, you know, like the ant colonies, the fundamental unit of humanity was not the individual, but the group, a group of maybe a hundred, hundred people living together. Um, they all know each other and they work as a collective intelligence. And if you think about how divided we've become, each of us from each other, and, um, that this division is perfectly consistent with, one could even argue necessary for the modern economy of commerce and money and overproduction and all that is, um, it, I mean, the way I see it in very simple terms, we're just in this wrong modality it's like it's almost like humanity has been downloaded with a software virus that has us believing that we're separate and that the name of the game is hoarding and accumulation and um you know the reality being that this modality of hoarding and accumulation and individuality is literally killing us and it's in the process of killing everything so we either snap out of it or we're all gonna die very, very soon. And 
snapping out of it is just the first step, this mental spiritual liberation to say, hey, this current modality is killing us. Um, we need to find a new modality. And my belief is that with collective super intelligence, with exactly what we're doing right here with the Friday block parties, we're creating an opening, a space for us to begin to walk through this portal, this doorway into uh, a modality where we are working together. We're deeply connected and we're sharing and we're waking up this collective super intelligence, this ability to collaborate and co-create and really unify, really come together, right? Um, in, uh, you know, and, and you know, that, yeah. mm -hmm. one of the things was it occurred to me, you know, because again, when I say occurred to me, uh, it occurred to to me through the supra intelligence, super intelligence, and supra intelligence all working together, uh, things external resonating with things internal. And we've talked about how there's there's a different type of corporation that's possible, and that's the worker self-directed enterprise. And that's where, you know, so for exa example, Radish, after a while, may want to say, okay, um, Jamin or your directors are gonna say, well, now's the time maybe we should give it over to the employees. You know, I, I do believe there's a period of time when you have to let somebody like Jamin bulldoze forward, get something happening, just like Jeff Bezos did. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if today Jeff Bezos said, all right, I think I've made enough money. I'm now turning this corporation, Amazon, over to the employees. And now the employees can now take it over as a worker self-directed enterprise and uh, run it, you know, with sociocracy or Robert's Rules of Order or whatever form of democratic worker owns worker directed uh, values. And so anyway, that's where, as an example of how if we, you know, we don't want to destroy Amazon, but we should really try to encourage it to say, okay, Jeff, have you made enough money? You know, you're, you got 130 billion in the bank. You know, is it now maybe time to let the employees run the, run the show and maybe they'll um, figure out a better, more equitable way to pay each other? Yeah, and in fact, um, I, I've, you know, I've, I've listened to a bunch of Richard Wolf stuff, uh, particularly going back a few years when my dad and I would listen to his program together. Um, and so I definitely love that whole concept. Now imagine that we were to expand that even way further so that all of humanity operated as one giant worker self-directed enterprise right and i think that's very much what we need to do right now we've all um uh here i'll just present it in the following terms what if on the titanic instead of running into an iceberg the way that the titanic sank was that um, all the passengers on the Titanic started playing this game of, you know, making stuff out of metal. And the way that they would make stuff out of metal is they'd first pry a part of met a piece of metal off of the ship itself and start working with it. And then everyone started getting into this game and then we all started trading our metal gadgets for money with each other. And, um, you know, here this new kind of metal making um, 
economy is happening on this ship. And for a while, everyone's very happy until, wait a second, we're destroying the very thing that's keeping us all afloat, right, by playing this game. And, um, you know, we need to stop that game and transform it into a new game of maybe rebuilding the ship. I think that might be a good, good sort of analogy. We spent the last several hundred, several thousand years destroying our ship in service of a game called hoarding and accumulation, which is not just a zero sum game, but a negative sum game, given all the destruction that it's provoking. And so what if we completely transformed our modality and our relationships to each other and to the ship and organized basically a big collective for rebuilding the ship and for taking care of all the individuals while we rebuild the ship. See, that's a really key part of it. Um, but before something like that could be a transition to a new modality could be successfully implemented, I believe two things would need to happen. Number one, the new modality would need to be sufficiently fleshed out, designed, right? And then second, a transition plan to go from the old modality to the new would have to be designed and then implemented, right? Designed, sold to the people. Hey, look, everybody, let's just, you know, take a break, take a pause so that we can communicate to you, A, what's happening with the ship, and B, what needs to happen if we're all going to survive. And then I yeah, I think it might be right, because what I said, say, let's say this, this huge ship is Amazon. Um, it, it's, per, it's probably very oversimplistic for me to think that Jeff Bezos could just say, okay, everybody, today... Uh, I'm handing over the reins of power to to the employees so they can have make a worker self-directed enterprise out of Amazon. It might just sink overnight. It might just crash, right? As you said, there need to be there would need to be a transition period where people would the employees would even know or learn what the heck is a worker self-directed enterprise. You can't just say, "Here, you drive." You know, to somebody who doesn't know how to drive, they're going to crash. Right, right. All right, Le Les, Les has his hand up. Yes, Les. Well, I was just watching a, a YouTube about Amazon and Jeff Bezos uh, a few days back. And um, the way Jeff runs that operation, uh, he has like cameras on the the warehouse workers and they have to like have these quotas where they have to like continue they have to work all the time they, they can't you know they can't communicate with each other there's no like hi and like how you doing and such it's just like everything is run as a tight ship <clears throat> The way he he operates Amazon, uh, he's not gonna relinquish, relinquish the, that operation to the employees. <laughs> no way, you know that that's just that's not how. I mean, <clears throat> his mode of operation is not gonna change. The way he got to be the the most wealthy uh, person in the world is not by like giving power to other people it's all by you know getting as much as you can as fast as possible so um i you know i i totally agree Les. um now back to this bigger picture analogy of there being one ship, one planet, and let's just use the Titanic as the metaphor. Um, bef 
again, the sequence that I would see is first we design the new modality, then design the transition plan, and third and finally, we communicate to the world in an efficient way that gets the right people's attention, et cetera, et cetera. And um, say, look, you know, in a nutshell, here's the death spiral that we're on. We have very little time left. Here's an alternative reality, and here's a pathway to get there. And here's the sequence of steps that we've been working out, and we're starting now, right? We're starting with this communication, and um, that let's just call that the revolution and it would not be a violent revolution but it would be a radical deep transformation of virtually everything we're doing on earth right now but it could happen in stages the first stage might be for our earlier conversation uh, inspired by what Miles was saying a bit ago, is the first stage might be, look, we're going to keep all the trains running, so no sharp discontinuities, disruptions, um, and we're going to implement SRM, right? So it's kind of like adding a whole new mega industry to the planet, the SRM industry, creating a whole bunch of jobs, government contracts, et cetera, et cetera. And so in the short term, uh, we keep everybody employed, we keep all the trains running, and we start to cool the planet, which would only have beneficial impacts. Um, and as we cool the planet, then we can afford to draw down the particulates and greenhouse gases generally. Mm -hmm. Yes, Les, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm all in favor of cooling the planet. It's just uh, that uh, that type of operation has to happen really quick. And uh, I don't know that we have, I mean, if we're going to do it that quickly, we really have to ramp up quick. And uh, it doesn't seem like, I mean, currently, it, even if it grows exponentially, um, I'm not sure that we have enough time to do it, but, you know, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the whole reason I'm here doing what I do is because I believe there is a chance. Could be a big chance, could be a small chance, but whatever it is, I believe the only thing that makes sense for me to do now and for the rest of my life is to pursue that chance with everything I've got. And that's why we do these 24 hour block parties and a lot of other things that we do. Um, because what else are we going to do? Give I agree, Jamin. Um, and so that's why I keep coming back to the block party. Uh, I, I think we, it is, we could ramp up very quickly. It's a matter of, as you said, getting the word out, getting enough mobilization of people to exert pressure on governments to change the, what we're doing on board the Titanic, or let's not, I don't know, spaceship Earth or our mother Earth, instead of calling it the Titanic, because we know what happened to the Titanic. But um, yeah, when, when we get into this SRM conversation, the solar radiation management conversation, I, there, there are some things that uh, would, could be quickly temporarily diverted to create these mirrors, you know? And so I'm really looking forward to participating as long as I can in that SRM segment uh, before I head downtown. So how much more time until we shift into the SRM conversation? Um, we're, we're just about ready. Um, if, in, a few, in a few minutes, it's four minutes until 7 a.m. Pacific time, which is when we had slated to start talking SRM. Um, but, you know, 
for me, that conversation is so intimately intertwined with collective superintelligence generally because in order to affect this SRM happening at a planetary scale all around the world is going to require massive planetary, um, I'm going to call them prerequisite achievements, right? You know, like to take a certain graduate level class at the university, you first need to accomplish certain prerequisites that prepare you for that. So before we can do SRM, the prerequisites that I see are number one, collective and superintelligence itself. We need to have some entity that we're seeking to create here that is at once absolutely brilliant in terms of collective IQ, right? Able to analyze and model and design not just engineering systems, but whole PR campaigns, social media campaigns, right? To orchestrate the collective transformation of our thoughts and what we're talking about and what we're prioritizing and what we see to be possible. Um, so I see collective superintelligence as just this massive prerequisite to being able to do SRM because short of collective superintelligence, we're, we are just another collection of people hanging around the cafe or the water cooler, just talking, right? To really make deep radical change happen. And that's, and SRM is deep radical change, no matter how you slice it, right? We need to get exponentially smarter collectively than what we are right now. Yeah, and I'd like to add that I believe that, again, we can't just say, oh, everybody just abandon your governments and just go out to the streets and start, you know, get your screwdrivers and hammers and nails and build a new world. I, I believe we don't have the time to just, and it would be so disruptive that we would crash even faster. We'd have a bigger train wreck. Um, but the reason, for example, I'm heading downtown today is because I need to talk to my fellow citizens in my jurisdiction, in my context, because we don't have time to go around doing a uh, GoFundMe for SRM. We need to get our governments to wake up and respond to we the people and and shift into the solar radiation management industry and get building these mirrors. And so from my jurisdiction here in Alberta, I'm thinking, okay, we have an oil and gas industry that is really suffering. We actually have four full-sized office towers sitting empty, really modern office buildings. That's because the oil and gas industry has crashed so dramatically. It's not getting any better with coronavirus. So it's like, okay, let's start making mirrors. We go up to Fort McMurray and we shift from exporting or thinking we're going to export oil and gas to using that oil and gas to make mirrors. And maybe that's the answer to the tailings mess they've created. They could maybe use that crap to make use of silica for their mirrors. It's tar sands, right? Um, and similarly, you're down in Washington, and something that we both share is uh, Hanford, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Now, why do I say I share it with you? It's because I'm downwind of it. It might be hard to fathom that Alberta's downwind of Washington, but actually it is. I learned that to my 
shock and surprise in 1982 when Mount St. Helens exploded. I was in southern Alberta and I woke up one morning and looked out the window and I'm thinking, gee, it was a sunny day last yesterday and all of a sudden now it's this gray and gloomy and oh, look at that. There's, there's a, a, the road's covered in water out there because this car drove by and it kicked up water mist. And then I realized that's not water, it's dust. The whole place is covered in dust. So anyway, long story short, in Hanford Nuclear Reservation, they're trying to clean up this huge nuclear mess and they're using vitrification. They want to vitrify the nuclear wastes. That means put it, store it in glass. So the, the, right now there's this huge plant to put out, make glass. Well, maybe maybe what people in Washington and the United States need to do is say, can we just put the vitrification of the nuclear waste on hold for a bit and use this to make some, you know, crank out mirrors? So this is, in summary, I believe we have to, in all of our countries, have to lobby our local governments, have them make appropriations for converting into this economy to convert, make these mirrors. So people in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, similarly, they say, well, let's, um, let's, let's use this fuel to turn the sand of the Arabian desert into mirrors. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, we need to do some major shifts like that. Um, Les, uh, Les has his hand up. I want to first welcome uh, Maida, Lawrence, uh, Nikki, Dylan, and uh, whoever has joined in via area code, what was that 425? 425 by phone. So welcome everyone. Feel free to chime in. We've got two folks with their hands up. Les and Emery, uh, but before we continue the conversation, Les and Emery, let me just pause for a moment to enable folks who've just joined to check in and say hello, if you wish. There's never any pressure to speak. Hey, Jeremy. Damon. Hey, How Dylan, welcome, welcome, how are you? <laughs> very good, uh, very empowered, very excited to be back. Um, so much to, so much to share. Um, I did want to let you know, um, I brought back Nick with me uh, from our last conversation, so he's with us. And then I also brought on, as well, just to introduce to the group, to the collective, um, one of my dear, dear friends and mentors, uh, Larry Ranta, Lawrence Ranta. Um, <clears throat> and he's, um, he's one, of the, one of the best networkers that I know uh, in, in the technology space, in uh, the investing space. Um, he's a solution provider uh, to a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of different groups. He's been on many different think tanks as well throughout his uh, years, and uh, I think he would um, really enjoy this conversation and really enjoy uh, the principles of collective intelligence. Um, he would be a wonderful addition, I think, to the group, to the circle, as we kind of think tank and work through some of the uh, you know roadblocks, not to say roadblocks, but uh, just the different phases we have to, sorry, I had a call coming in, uh, just uh, to go through some of the different phases that we want to reach to uh, pick up momentum. Uh, he's also on up to give as well. Um, I'm actually got introduced to uh, up to give by Larry and uh, Nick. So uh, they're all veterans of that. But I was wondering, um, Larry, if you wanted to, um, well, first off, maybe Jamin, just, just for uh, Larry's benefit and um, uh, just to have you maybe give a 30,000 foot view of collective intelligence, kind of how you're building this collective with everyone around the world. If you want to just give a 30,000 foot view of that for him and just uh, let the conversation soar from there. And if I could hear here, uh, Dylan, maybe second that with Larry. Hey, uh, aloha, Jamin. 
is Nick Scardino from Honolulu, Hawaii. It's bright, uh, not, e not even bright yet. So it's, <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> hence the, uh, the no phone signal. I mean, the uh, no pictures over here right now. It's just. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, but it's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. You're going to love Larry. He's just, uh, I couldn't have said it any better, any more, uh, uh, any more well better put than Dylan. So, but hey, but Nikki's the, Nikki's the nickname. So, hey, by all means, Nikki away. So, <laughs> Nikki, Nikki. Right on. Yeah, um, tricky, tricky Nikki's in the house. So, yeah, oh, absolutely. Beautiful. Welcome, Nikki. Aloha, Kako. And aloha to everyone. And Dylan, thank you so much for that introduction i'm very very could, happy. could could uh you wait a minute i think he actually dropped i'm just seeing if he's still there yeah yeah, yeah. i did see i did see lawrence lawrence on previously and uh, we also have somebody somebody dialed in on who has i think that's larry. that looks like larry's cell phone oh okay oh okay that could yeah, be you're probably but, right me, but he could be check. uh he could be shuffling around so let me um, check once yeah that is his cell phone you're right okay yeah. okay all right cool yeah. All right. So yeah, well, go go for it. You're, he's with us. Okay, <laughs> great. And well, welcome, Larry. Feel free to um, introduce yourself whenever you'd like. I thought I'd let uh, Les and Emery uh, make comments. That they've ha they've had their hands up. Um, so Les, if you want to make a comment, and followed by Emery, and then um, Dylan for your kind request, I'll be very very happy. Thank to you. Have Perfect. The overview at that point. So Les, Les, please, please take it away. And welcome Ed, who just joined us as well. Go ahead, Les. Um, well, as far as making glass goes, uh, what you need to make glass, turn uh, sand into glass is you need heat. And uh, we don't need fossil fuels for that because we have the sun. The sun has a huge amount of energy. And if you if you've you use mirrors to focus them in, uh, in a small volume, you can get like tremendous temperatures. So we could potentially wrap that ramp that up quite remarkably. They have these towers where they focus the sun. Uh, on a tower and they heat uh, salt into the molten state. And that same technology could be used to melt glass. And we don't have to like use tar sands or anything else to make it happen. So that's a good thing. Yeah, just to follow up, just to follow up on that, um, everyone's aware of waste to energy technologies, right? I mean, there's incredible stuff where you're just taking entire waste deposits, um, you know, just all over the world, there's a lot of trash, right? So there's amazing technologies where we could just clear up the trash issue and attach uh, even like a factory or a manufacturing center um, that's, that's use, utilizing that power where we're just dumping trash. I mean, you can incinerate anything um, and that would help that issue and provide power. So just a, a systems integration there, if anyone wants to comment. Totally, totally. Yeah, love both those comments. Um, a lot to be explored in terms. Of, I really like what Les said about solar th using basically solar thermal power generation principles, but instead of generating electricity, you just use that heat directly to melt sand to be able to yep. test, uh, mirrors, etc. So good stuff. And we'll explore that a lot of that as we get deeper into the SRM discussion after after a broader overview about collective intelligence. Uh, next, I first want to welcome the folks who've recently joined, including Mark and Ed and uh, Emery. You've had your hand up. So take it away, Emery. Okay, Karen. Uh, I just want to say once again uh, that uh, it's really great to see so many people are, uh, are uh, coming to the block party and um, they have the understanding of what's what's on the table here and um you know my concern my main concern is how do we reach people you know and how do we develop um a way the ways and means to um designate people certain people 
with, uh, with the necessary, people with the necessary skills and aptitude to, um, you know, to do the, to do the work, you know, I mean, we have to get the hands on to, uh, to accomplish what needs to be done. You know, it's, it's fine and dandy that we could uh, talk about it and, you know, shed light on the problem, but we really have to, we really have to amp it up uh, tremendously and, and uh, expand our reach into, um, into the media, you know? And um, we have to provide an incentive for, for people at, who are at the top of industry and technology to uh, become involved. I mean, I don't know, do we have to scare the, the living hell out of them or what? We, we have to present make a presentation strong enough, strong enough to provide the chilling effect to, to get these people motivated and geared up to start doing stuff, you know? We could talk about this all day long. I mean, we gotta get action uh, going, you know? And I think this is part of our job here as, as a collective, you know, we're the beginnings of, or, uh, let's say, but we have to find ways, like how to be more, uh, more vivid in, 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 our, in our explanations, in our facts, how we present everything. Uh, we, we have to uh, make a massive improvement here. Well, we're not going anywhere. Totally agree, Emery. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm looking forward to giving an overview here. I also want to let folks check in who have just joined. Ed has his hand up. Uh, Ed, love to hear from you. Welcome. Ed, unmute my mic there for a second. I want to address the comment that was just made because I'm designing, conceptualizing a way of moving these kinds of projects out of the lab and into the world. And that's my focus of activity. And I'm looking at cryptocurrency financing techniques to do that so it would not require waiting to convince major corporations or others to do something but could get instead large numbers of people, comma, in essence, ordinary people, comma, uh, involved to help move this forward, both in terms of small amounts of dollars and involvement in the process. Uh, I'm talking to a number of people and doing different kind of scenario planning about how that may come, up, come up about and particularly using a project out of Lehigh University and a friend of mine who is former chief research scientist at Air Products and Chemicals, a well-known chemist with American Chemical Society, Chemist of the Year, and has about 40 patents. He has in the midst or is in the midst of processing a way to store solar, wind, geothermal, uh, other such renewable power sources uh, by using them to convert water into hydrogen, putting the hydrogen into a liquid hydrocarbon and then getting the energy back out through a fuel cell. With a liquid hydrocarbon, it can be shipped in existing infrastructure like pipelines. So if it was generated in the high sun areas of the country that might be uh, desert areas or in high wind areas, it could be shipped to other parts of the nation like the East Coast and converted to power or can be used in just a tanker truck to move it from place to place. So I have a number of people I've been in conversation on how to do that and we're exploring both traditional financing methods and potentially cryptocurrency financing methods uh, and the use of so-called blockchain-based LLCs, 
Vermont has passed legislation enabling that at the request of my local state representative. I've had conversations with him that here in Pennsylvania, we might create legislation to authorize so-called BBLLCs or blockchain-based LLCs. So there are some ways to get more people involved, potentially, uh, and to move these things, a variety of different projects in a faster way out of the research phases into prototypes and hopefully out to the rest of the world. I'm attempting to kind of look at the theme of design globally, build locally. And from there, I'll be quiet. Beautiful, Ed. Thank you so much. Really great to have everyone here. Awesome stuff. Well, I think this is a great moment um, for Dylan's request to give kind of a 30,000 foot overview of uh, collective super intelligence and what our, when I say our, I'm speaking of uh, the Radish team, but really the, the goal is to extend this uh, to everyone uh, to participate in all the way to Cork, Ireland. Welcome, uh, James, who just joined us from Ireland. Great to see you. Um, so we're just kind of giving a broad overview at this point. So um, the, here's, here's kind of a broad overview of collective superintelligence. And I'm going to ask everyone to uh, put on your imagination caps. And we're going to imagine a little ways, in, a, a ways into the future um, for uh, this scenario. So imagine we're at a future where in addition to the 12 of us who are on this video conference at the moment, plus whoever is watching, that in addition to this one video conference that the, the dozen of us are involved in right now, um, there are literally a million others. So a total of a million conversations happening in parallel. On the broadest spectrum of topics, imaginable um, and there will be notable concentrations of topics and people on certain um, specific areas like solar radiation management and so we're going to get into solar radiation management as an example in a little bit uh, to talk about the different facets, all of which must be mastered in order to make planetary scale SRM a reality. Um, those facets span scientific, engineering, political, social, cultural, marketing, religious, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so these million conversations that would be happening in parallel um, a significant percentage of those would presumably be oriented around solar radiation management and all these myriad facets that need to be mastered holistically and uh, for the most part simultaneously. So um, we'll talk about how we get from here to a million video conferences happening in parallel in a little bit, but first the big picture general idea. So imagine we're there, we've got a million video conferences happening on all these different topics. Uh, this video conference is being recorded and broadcast and will be transcribed. It's not being transcribed in real time, but it will be transcribed. In the future, when we're at this, cross this threshold of a million video conferences, which is somewhat arbitrary, and imagine at that time, that each and every one of those million video conferences is being transcribed into text in real time, and that that text is being indexed by Google and others in real time, so that anyone can do a search to see, um, hey, I want to find conversations that are talking about this combination of topics or this set of topics, right? So sort of like a form of advanced search like you can do on Google currently, but way more powerful in terms of um, 
you're being able to specify not just keywords and topics, but relationships between topics. So for example, right, um, I might type in the keywords SRM and planetary overheating, right? And say, hey, show me all the topics uh, that relate to those two. Um, and I might find a, a conversation where people are talking about SRM and planetary overheating, but they might be saying, here's all the reasons why we should not use SRM <laughs> to address planetary overheating, but we should address, you know, use other solutions. And so um, let's suppose I didn't want to be, I didn't want that conversation, but I want conversations where people are saying, yes, we can use SRM to solve planetary overheating. So we have two topics, SRM and planetary overheating, and then we have a relationship that connects them. SRM as solution for planetary overheating, or SRM solves planetary overheating. You see that? So it goes way beyond keywords and actually um, uh, would enable us to do much more complex searches involving relationships between topics, et cetera. We might also choose to put on filters for our search that say, look, I wanna be talking with these certain kinds of people about this set of topics and relationships. So for example, I may want to uh, uh, talk only with engineers about specific engineering solutions to cool the planet using SRM. Or somebody else might come in and say, hey, I want to be talking with marketing and PR folks about how do we sell the urgency of this to the world, right? So uh, the bottom line is that uh, with what we're envisioning, people would be able to do very specific searches to find exactly those conversations that they want to plug into, right? How many times in life have you been working on something and you've been kind of stuck and you haven't really figured out the way to move forward until someone has introduced you to the right person or the right group or the right idea or the right something that boom, suddenly unblocks you and you're able to see a path forward, right? And maybe even partner with some of those people that you've just discovered to move the thing forward. You follow me, right? So, so much of life for me, thank you, James, is, is like that. It's, um, we're not able to move forward with what we want to achieve because there's something that's in our way. There's something that we don't know, or there's someone who we haven't been introduced to yet, which when we're introduced, um, we're able to work together and accomplish that. So that's the fundamental hypothesis here, is that what's holding us back from implementing all these major changes that we need to implement to save life on earth, to save ourselves, um, that what's holding us back is this lack of connectivity to people, to groups, to topics, to conversations that will really move things forward. So now imagine that, um, just hypothetically, that the 12 of us who are here together uh, came together to, because there was some common problem that we all chose to come together to solve. And let's say that we solve it in the next 20 minutes. Once that problem is solved, where do we go from here? Well, each of us has our own pathway, or maybe all, all 12 of us have chosen to follow us uh, the same pathway towards solving us, getting SRM to be fully implemented to cool the planet. Well, once we've solved that first problem, and we continue to progress down whatever line of development or exploration, we might hit yet another problem that needs to be solved. Um, and so you could think of life as a series of problems that need to be solved, right? Um, just think about going about your day. Well, first I need to get breakfast. That's a problem to solve. Then I need to get over here to the office and meet with these people to solve whatever problem. And then I'll go to some other meeting to solve whatever problem. So that's the same basic paradigm, but now we're looking at it from the standpoint of, we have this network of say a million conversations happening in parallel. And um, humanity as a whole, or that portion of humanity that's participating 
has a whole bunch of objectives, right? I keep going, coming back to SRM, but SRM is really a whole pyramid of objectives that all roll up to at the very top full planetary scale implementation of SRM. But to get that and so, solar radiation management, just so that's Thank clear. You. Thank you. Yes, yes. And everybody, please interject just as Dylan just did. If there's any clarification needed or any question or anything like that, just jump in. This is collective intelligence. What Dylan just did is collective intelligence. So feel free to just jump in. Um, if you have a longer point to make, then, you know, just raise your hand and, and uh, I'll, I'll call on you. Um, right now, I'm kind of monologuing myself just to kind of give this overview and then we'll, uh, we'll morph it into a discussion in a, in a few minutes here. Um, so um, in my mind, I kind of have this visual of clusters of people like the dozen of us coming together and in conversation, either solving a problem or clarifying that problem Clarifying it could include, involve breaking it down into constituent problems that need to be solved. So let's say we identify some big problem that we're all working on, and as we talk about it and work through it, we determine that to solve this one big problem, we actually need to solve these 10 constituent problems, right? So we may spawn literally 10 other video conferences, each one addressing a certain one of those 10 constituent problems. Once all 10 of those have been solved, then boop, we go back to the roll up general meeting where we identified those 10 to begin with and say, okay, now that those 10 have been solved, now let's go back to the general objective that we had and how do we move forward on that? You guys see what I'm saying? All right? So I'm just kind of creating this story, this narrative of a general framework of humanity, people, groups, forming around a certain objective, achieving that objective, and then going on to whatever is next. So as an individual- Can I, can I interject a, a parallel process? Please, Ed, please. Uh, and that would be also to have people then talk about financing those activities. So proposals are put up and chosen based on the ones that seem are worthwhile to back. Uh, I've been looking at some software being created by a group called DAO Stack, D-A-O, for decentralized autonomous organizations. They have a product called Alchemy that is used for resource allocation. And potentially, from what you're saying, at one of those points, somebody says, we have something to solve. Here's my proposal to solve it then a number of people would vote on that proposal and in essence commit funds by their voting so that it would move forward and actually have people working on it and be able to make their living or part of their living by solving the problem. The DAOs are the future for sure. Yep. Totally. You know, I, I love it. So for example, let's say that the 12 of us here whatever solution we come up with, we might then uh, instantiate a DAO, boom, literally over the course of this meeting. Uh, sounds like we've got some of the folks who know how to do that right here, right now. And that's kind of the whole point of collective intelligence. You get the right combination of people who collectively span all the knowledge and tools and resources to meet whatever objective we're working on right here, right now. Uh, building on the previous example, then we go ahead and create the DAO, boom, it's now an entity, an autonomous entity, right? Um, you know, built with software and services and blockchain and whatever else. And now it's doing its thing as an entity, right? And then as an entity, you can imagine that DAO participating in a video conference like this one. Why not? Right? And so, AI could be talking with us, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. may, I, may I suggest that the DAO already would exist. It would have several million people in it. It would simply be a particular proposal that is acted on, so you don't have the step of having to create it. Uh, and people have already made commitments, and now they're found a particular proposal that's being made, and they say, that's the one I can support. 
and their support may be both in terms of uh, their commitment of crypto coin to currency or, and or their involvement in being paid to do part of it. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Uh, I'm not the greatest expert in crypto or DAOs or anything like that, but I do have this general notion that I think we're talking about here is that a DAO uh, fundamentally is organized around a contract or a series of contracts where let's say you've got millions of people who have already committed resources and say, listen, as soon as there's a solution that's designed and tested and ready to go, then please use my contribution of resources to get it implemented, right? And each and the DAO or individuals participating in the DAO can specify their criteria for when to pull the trigger, so to speak, on actually using these resources uh, to accomplish whatever objective. So the way I see it is there are millions of DAOs which need to be created, um, which are missing pieces in this giant machinery of planet Earth that once all those missing pieces are in place doing their part, then the world will be working holistically, cooling itself, regenerating ecosystems, et cetera, right? And so we simply, simply <laughs> need to collectively create all of these DAOs, contracts, mechanisms uh, for instigating all this transformation. And I think that's where uh, Dylan and Nikki and Lawrence and others who are uh, working uh, with uh, up to give and other fundamental mechanisms and platforms to facilitate all this. In fact, last Tuesday, when we were, this Tuesday, three days ago, when we were talking about all this, we speculated that if collective superintelligence is the brain, right, of this new world that we're co-creating, then all of these um, uh, DAOs and uh, up to give and all these financial uh, instruments and mechanisms of channeling resources would be sort of like the bloodstream of this new world. So you got the brain, the bloodstream. We also gave an example of the stomach. And so the big, big picture here <laughs> to step back at an even higher level from this conversation is to say that we're collectively co-creating collectively designing and collectively creating um, the missing pieces of the corpus of humanity and planet Earth that are missing in order for this whole planet, this whole world to function again, I would say. I would say there are times in the past when we functioned well as a planet, but now we've gone a bit overboard on the current modality of humanity. Uh, of separation, et cetera. Um, all right, great conversation. Well, I see we've got, uh, Emery has his hand raised. And at this point I say, let's just, let's, let's let it flow. I've put forward a few ideas here um, of this kind of network of people and conversations collectively generating a planetary super intelligence that can generate all these DAOs and other missing pieces and mechanisms, et cetera, to, to create a whole world. Um, so let's let's let it flow from here. All right, Emery has his hand up. Go ahead, I, go ahead, Emery. I just had uh, just had a way of looking at it. You know, we've got all these great ideas to move ahead and whatnot, but uh, I also have to look at it like a like a flesh eating disease. You know, we're gonna have to get the fortitude to be uh, able to cut away the the diseased parts of, uh, of 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 the whole you know and uh, that's gonna take a lot of uh, cojones we gotta we gotta get messed up and we gotta cut out the the disease uh, as as we progress yeah that's a really good point Emery I've been talking about things that we need to add to the world but equally important uh, we need to figure out how to take away uh, that which should never have been here in the first place and which is destroying us. Really good point. Uh, Dylan, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, Dylan. Thank you. Well, uh, Larry's on his phone, so he can't raise his hand, but I just want to voice for him. Um, Larry, if you want to introduce yourself to the group 
and just get a little more connected and get a feel for what you can add to the conversation. Your, you know, just a little bit about your background and just different ways that you are always looking to provide solutions to different things like this. So I'd love to have you introduce yourself and, and uh, continue the conversation from there. For yeah, everyone else. Here, here. Thank you, Dylan. Welcome, Larry. Anytime that's good for you, just feel free to jump in, especially since you're on your phone. Just, just jump in. Don't, don't, uh, uh, don't wait for the perfect moment. Yeah. I think you're muted, Larry. But. Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. You, we can see that you are muted, Larry. So if you can unmute. How do you unmute your phone, actually? Is it like star something? Oh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to unmute it. Okay, Larry. Oh, perfect. I, I, just, unmuted, I just unmuted you, Larry. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Perfect. I can hear you. Th thank you. Um, are any of you familiar with a company called Battelle? Yeah, is that the big old one based in Columbus, Ohio, that's been around for decades? Yeah, 90 years. They're, they're supposed to be the largest think tank in the world outside the government. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, originally you were talking about in situ electrification, and uh, they obviously have always been involved in that for at least the last... 30 years or more. And they came into the uh, nuclear plants to do the cleanup for a lot of the nuclear waste companies. So they're at Oak Ridge, they're at Los Alamos, they're at um, Hanford, obviously. And <clears throat> so they know that topic very well. They've looked for better ways to do it to, to, other than to glassify, but right now that's where it is. But heating it by the sun, I think, is an excellent uh, way of doing it. But the other thing I wanted to say too is that you had talk, talked about solar radiation. <clears throat> and Battelle is on, uh, they actually have a research lab or maybe more that, that actually study that. I, I don't work with a company anymore, I used to. But they're doing, uh, I think they have a, a, a research facility in uh, Florida. Uh, and they specifically work with solar and how to solve the, the problem for humanity. So my thought is, why not bring one of these people to be a part of this group as to helping us in two ways. One, the knowledge that they have, the insider knowledge they have, but secondly, the funding they have. Um, probably 90% of the company's funding comes from the government. And if we wanna solve a big problem, and we have somebody like that on our side, they listen to Battelle to help them solve problems. The government goes to them. So just a, just a suggestion. And if we want to have more knowledge of a particular subject, getting somebody like that from one of the companies like that would be a good one to have on this because a lot of the people that work there are, you know, they want to do good for the planet whether it be for the oceans or the atmosphere, uh, whatever it may be. <clears throat> so that's just a thought. Uh, I still might know a few of the people I could just check with and see if, if that's of interest to having them join with us. That'd be great to introduce them on like next Friday or something, Larry. That'd be great. So I can try to read. I knew I used to know the the manager of one of the facility or the GM for one of the facilities. But the uh, thing is, I haven't talked to him in a long time. So we'll just have to see. I was also thinking, Larry, too, like um, your other uh, sovereign nation connections. It would be wonderful yeah. maybe to speak with your chief friend that, um, I mean, they're all about Mother Earth, of course. So, and they have quite a lot of capital as well. And that would be something that uh, maybe that would be an introduction uh, later on that you could make um, because I think this would be right up their alley, making sure there's a, you know, a biological ecosystem left for us uh, with this, with uh -huh. this campaign. So, I mean, that, that was just other things like that came to mind that would be totally synchronized with their sure. uh, mission. Just an and, idea. And I'm, uh, I I'm, that, Dylan. I was just going to suggest bringing the tribes in. Hi, everyone. Yep. Great. And, um, we have Tulalip tribes here. They have a casino. 
muckle shoot have a casino um and i'm actually going to do an outreach to some of them i meant to mention that to you jamin as an idea um because i'm connected to Tulalip tribes um from the past and um, i also think we need to bring in um, tribal voices so when i was listening to you guys talking one of the uh, thoughts that came to me was um, around someone was talking about fear and people turning away from this big problem we're facing um, and I'm thinking if we bring tribes in who have this voice and this way of living with Mother Earth um, we can use elder wisdom and we need more women's voices as well because we are nurturing voices and uh, we can tell these stories and bring people in through this kind gentleness and this love for Mother Earth and for life. And um, also when we come up with new ideas, um, some people are very visionary, like all of you are visionaries, and sometimes it's hard for the masses to hear a visionary or see a vision and um so perhaps through the women through the tribes we can tell these stories and bring people into the fold so i'm just thinking like how do we get people to to not turn in fear from what's happening but to embrace this change that's coming here to this this realm um, and start to become part of the solution rather than part continuing to be part of the harming Mother Earth. Thank you, sweetheart. Beautiful. That's fantastic. That, that is fantastic. Larry, Larry, what tribe are you connected with? I wonder if they're connected. Uh, well, they all know each other. Uh, James Brown right. Clallam tribe on the Olympic Peninsula. Awesome. I perked canoes with a Haida for 14 years. You did what? I curved canoes with a Haida for 14 years. Oh. oh. I'm connected with the You know, Alaska. it sounds like uh, several of you are from the Seattle area. Yes, we are. Is that true? Uh, so am I. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, but, I but I currently live in Austin, Texas. But I'm actually from Seattle. I've lived in Seattle most of my life. So beautiful. Yeah. Just to uh, uh, come on top of that, Melissa is the. Oh, sorry. Continue, Melissa. I, I was just wondering what your connection to the tribes are. Oh, my connection. Uh, I went to college with the uh, the, the gentleman that. Uh, and actually grew up with the gentleman that runs the James and, and built the James uh, Town Clellum tribe. Have you been over there recently and seen their, all the things they've built? No. On the peninsula? No, <clears throat> That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Everything is perfect and spotless. Wow. You go into one of their stores, they're spotless. They're building a four-store hotel. Um, they have a big casino, like most all of them do and he's also he legislates for the tribe and other tribes back in washington dc so he's rarely rarely lives uh in washington he's in washington dc most of the time so that's my connection so i just know them really well thank you yeah and if i can just uh, uh come in on this point there i mean the tribes have been so uh, I mean, ever since the 1800s, they've been, well, even longer than that, they've just been pushed out, pushed out, pushed around, pushed around, but, um, and their funds have, uh, um, I don't know, we've just been keeping them down, so to speak, for lack of a better description. Uh, they're, um, uh, I mean, case in point, I know of one tr uh, tribe in um, mid-America here that uh, their account has 225, you know, well, it's a nine-figure account, let's put it this way. Um, but you'd figure over that time, you know, with their banking interests and so forth, that they would have uh, created more wealth. But uh, 16 years later, their account's still at that same nine-figure amount. Uh, in other words, the bank is just keeping them down and not letting them increase their wealth as they should be, literally here. So this is, uh, um, yeah, they would be so forthright uh, uh, looking forward to uh, being able to um, 
utilize funds as opposed to having them under wraps. Let's put it that way. So this, I, I, and Larry, it's, it's so true, this forum that, uh, you know, with Jamin and so forth, I think this is just the perfect avenue for them to be, you know, be not afraid, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it is just such a, uh, um, uh, you know, this, this, this whole block party is just such a great way just to um, break the ice, so to speak. And it's just, I cannot, oh, this is, this is getting better and better by, you know, second time around, Jamie. So, I'm, oh, this is awesome. Good times for 7 a.m. here in Hawaii or 5 a.m. here in Hawaii. <laughs> right on. Melissa, uh, someone trying to speak? Oh, M Melissa, I think you yeah. or something. No, I don't think so. Can you hear oh, me? Now, now we can hear you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Dylan and Jamin. What I was saying is that um, our partnership as non-Native people with Native tribes is really, I believe, essential that we need to have this cross-racial collaborating <clears throat> in order to lift these um, uh, challenges that First Nations face around loans, around finances, everything, basically. Um, and um, social justice is a very big issue now in the Northwest. And local government agencies are doing a lot to uh, change that. So the more of this, this interracial collaboration, the stronger we'll get to all together. Beautiful, beautiful, great conversation. I'm really thankful for everyone here, everyone's comments. Uh, Miles up in Canada uh, has his hand raised. Go ahead, Miles. Thanks, Jamin. Yes, I totally agree with the incorporation of uh, the First Nations wisdom. And when I first started this quest as to, well, you know, what am I going to do in my home stretch? I'm a boomer, got laid off. My wife wants me out of the house doing something and she's losing her patience, but she's like, what are you doing? You're always online, you know, with people like you. So anyway, I have to get out the door. And I really, um, early on, when I was thinking of Einstein saying, we have to come up with a new way of thinking, you know, otherwise we're doomed. I thought, okay, what other ways of thinking are there? And I, I am a man and I have a man brain and man brain has been running the show basically for in the Western civilization for a couple thousand years. And so I thought, well, what other ways of thinking are there? And, and indeed the indigenous wisdom, I thought maybe there's something there. And with the wonders of YouTube, I started, um, watching YouTube videos about indigenous wisdom. And Russell Means, um, leader of the American Indian movement back in the 70s, I guess it was, he's, he's got a lot of stuff. He's passed away. Um, when I mention Russell Means, some people, even ind indigenous women have said, well, he's not a great role model. However, the thing was, he suffered under the conditioning of the imposed colonizers. So, nevertheless, he taught me about the concept of matriarchy, which wasn't even a word in my vocabulary. And so, with um, inspiration, as I said, from being part of the social club, I've been, I've been also reaching out to my indigenous neighbors. And in Canada, we are, we are working through what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And yesterday, uh, towards that end, circumstances, one thing led to another. I went back to, to visit my Indigenous neighbors. And I, um, I have already talked with the previous chief, Lee Crowchild, a couple of years ago about you know, what is it going to take for reconciliation to truly happen? 
and you know saving mother earth is probably what what greater cause to unite around and reconcile around than saving mother earth yesterday i went out back to the tutina nation to carry on my conversations as to what i can do and you know we can do collectively and so i also have uh, uh moving forward on you know sharing this idea and talking about the block party and what we might do to you know come together establish mutual agreements to move forward because what what i'm what the reason why i don't join the solutions club aspect of of radish is because i'm still trying to come to terms with what is the culture that i need to that be part of before i can say all right i am going to participate in solutions so that's where i'm uh, where i'm at this is a great platform to share these things yeah beautiful miles i'm i'm glad you mentioned uh, culture. Culture is something we're just co-creating here. Just think of how unique this is, um, where this is a venue that's open for any human being on the planet to click on a link and join for free. And we're all here talking. I mean, it's just, it's unprecedented in the history of humanity that we have these tools that we can do this. And Sure, people have been video conferencing for years, but it's been very private on the down low. Um, we're now opening it up to be not just totally public, but very long format. This is only for 24 hours. It's totally feasible for any of us to reach out right now and say, hey, join us for the next 22 hours. We're going to be going strong talking about all these different topics. And the 24 hour window also makes it totally equal for anyone anywhere in the world regardless of time zone uh it'll sweep the full 24 hour clock so um <laughs> i'm just so thrilled uh the singularity is near the singular i would say it's here <laughs> and we just need to usher it along absolutely uh less I'm sorry. Les just... has his hand up, uh, followed by Melissa. Go ahead, Les. Well, if this grows exponentially, we'll be uh, talking 24-7 pretty quick. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, I have a question, uh, kind of for Dylan, I guess. And, and Jamin, um, so say one of us in, in this collective that's happening has an idea, like say going to one of the tribes who has a casino and talking with them. How do we and where do we, you know, the how and the where. So say you connect with someone, then what's the next step? You're asking for funding for something particular, let's say SRM, solar radiation management then what happens? Who do they get in contact with? You know, so mm -hmm. I think there's some other steps we need to start talking about now. Because right now, Damon, you've been really working on the, with Nolan and et cetera, you know, creating this platform, creating block party, getting us together for some more work. Pointing, then what? What's next? Yeah, Melissa, yeah. Um, that was something that uh, we had a little bit of discussion around, uh, I think it was last Tuesday uh, with Ye. Um, and uh, there are definitely some structures that should be in place as far as, you know, what is the umbrella uh, company that's gonna be receiving the funding for disbursement for this initiative. It could be the Roland Institute of Harvard. It could be um, a nonprofit organization that Ye creates um, or a, um, physical sponsor of one um so those were brought up in the previous conversation i think um to ed's point earlier uh what we do have currently that i gifted the community so far is our up to give uh, uh financing platform that's strictly 
uh, surrounding uh, the blockchain technology component. So it's all peer-to-peer -peer contributions, almost uh, uh, GoFundMe style. So that's utilizing the blockchain and that infrastructure for direct uh, contributions from anybody uh, that would also allow them to put their own personal passion projects uh, on that site as well as supporting the SRM umbrella project. So that was a in-depth thing that we looked at last Tuesday. And I think, you know, one of the things I would imagine, especially with your contacts and Larry's contacts, I, I think, and Jamin might suggest just having um, just an invitation, just a conversation, just uh, just kind of like, this is who we are. You know, we really care about this. Um, I, I think keeping it pretty open um, and not so direct or like, this is what we want from you kind of thing. I would rather have it much more of um, like what we're doing right now, just kind of like an unfolding, a strategy, a think tank. I would just say, present it to them as like, we would like you to join our think tank on this really crucial issue. And we would like to have your wisdom, your involvement in helping us develop this path to making sure there's a future for humanity and for a legacy of your people. So I would, I would just frame it in such a way. I mean, there, there will be business plans, I imagine. There will be, I would hope, videos that I could even help create. Um, but I think just introducing them to the collective and this conversation would be the first step. Um, any comments, anybody? Yeah, that sounds really right to me. I love that suggestion. Thanks, Don. Yeah, and that was actually the genesis of the block party was just this frustration of humanity not coming together in a totally egalitarian, open way that would support the manifestation of collective superintelligence. So we just said, enough is enough. This is a few weeks ago. Let's start a weekly block party. And we started on Valentine's Day. This is the third block party. So um, uh, I really love it. It's just a way for us to get together in conversation and sort all of this out collectively. And um, I'll, I'll take a couple of minutes to share about kind of how we see this growing from this one video conference to a whole network of video conferences. And um, so imagine, and we were talking about this yesterday quite a bit, imagine that we um, develop a, a form of, for lack of a better word, tagging, right? Um, with like hashtags, we came up with the term yesterday, super tag, <laughs> right? Which, and this gets back to what I was talking about earlier about how, um, let's say we have a we're having a great conversation a great series of conversations we want to be able to tag it in such a way and you know tweet about it and push it out through the social uh, media channels in whatever ways so that um anyone can start a conversation on the block party right it doesn't have to be through us or anything like that anyone can start a, a zoom video conference on whatever topic tag it appropriately, push it out there so that as more and more people are listening and saying, okay, I'm keeping an eye on this block party. I watch it from time to time, but you know, uh, I don't really like these meetings led by Jamin. He seems to talk a lot and whatever. Ah, but someone else is starting another meeting over here in the block party. In other words, it's tagged in such a way that it associates it with this general movement, for lack of a better word, um, that seems to me a, one important step towards decentralization and expanding the network of conversations. Because obviously we're only going to get but so far having just a single video conference room. Um, so how do we expand from here to a whole network of conversations? Obviously, everything has to start somewhere. So I'm very happy with the way that we're starting here. But I'm just suggesting a way to really decentralize it and let anyone start conversations on any topic that they want, but still be under the broad block party umbrella. It looks like, Emery, you've got your hand raised. You've got a comment. Go ahead, Emery. Yeah, Jamin, I was just had a question for you. 
Um, are you, uh, do you have a, a Twitter set up uh, for uh, Radish? Um, we've set it up, but we haven't used it yet. Okay, well, this is what I, this is, oh, no one has, sorry. This, this is what I was uh, thinking about. You know, I think I did go to, uh, to look it up and uh, there wasn't anything happening. And uh, that could be a platform that could be ser uh, ser serving us very well. You, um, you have to get on top of that. And um, they have their live streaming also, um, you know, that you could, uh, you could stream video uh, conferences from that, from that point and people get, could easily get involved through that uh, platform um, given that you can retweet it, you can leave comments, you can uh, leave a video comment, what, you know, uh, people could have a, a, a decent way of getting involved at, uh, at different levels of the game, you know, so uh, I think you have to work more on that or find people willing to, uh, to help with that uh, goal to uh, you know, um, uh, make the, the, the sites, the social sites a lot more functional, you know, um, like I've noticed, uh, you know, the Facebook thing is working a little bit, but, uh, there's practically no, there's no pushing. There's no, nobody is, uh, is forwarding the information to all their contacts, you know, um, people have to be willing to to make the effort to uh, uh, you know retweet it, repost it to get people aware that this is going on, you know, on on a multitude of platforms. You know, um, given the fact that we're so divided now, everybody's like in different places. You know, Steam it, uh, you know, and. Uh, you know, there's so many different platforms now, whereas before there was a lot of centralization of, of, of people. You know, a lot of people at Facebook only or, you know, YouTube. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then people kind of have dispersed into different pl different places. So it's, it's hard to bring everybody back together again, you know. So we're going to have more work to do to go to these platforms and set up, set up a, a portal, you know, so that people can connect back to uh, to what uh, we're all trying to accomplish. Absolutely, Emery. Great points. Great points. We can definitely do a heck of a lot more with Twitter, um, with Facebook, with Instagram, with Reddit, with YouTube. So, and that's part of our. Our, our challenge and our project here is how do we leverage all these different platforms in an, in an integrated way um, while at the same time launching our own platform. In fact, one name that we've come up with for this network that we're creating here is the social network of actual conversations. And I would posit that if somebody types in some text into Facebook or tweets something, that's not an actual conversation. This that's happening right here, right now, this is an actual conversation because we're talking with each other, face to face, using our voices, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thanks, Emery. Miles, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, Miles. Yes, thank you. Now, talking about platforms and the indigenous people, um, one of the things that they're very careful of for good reason is to retain ownership of their stories. They'll be very, very reluctant to um, just join any platform to share their stories because they've been ripped off so much, you know, for 500 years. Um, and this is where I think I will be, you know, waiting and seeing as well because what kind of platform is Radish going to be over time? Is it going to be another YouTube, another Google? Um, because 
the YouTube model is everybody's putting content onto YouTube. And I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an expert in it, but content is value. Content is, is worth something. And YouTube recognizes that. And their model is, here's our platform. Yeah, go ahead, post your content out there. And if you get enough subscribers, we'll dribble a little bit of advertising revenue to you. So people make a pittance but there's a lot of people watching even small channels like your channel, Jamin, or the Radish channel. And if you add up all those small YouTube producers, there's a lot of viewers. And YouTube gets to slide in some advertising eventually onto that content and uh, make some real serious coin and send a few dribbles out to Jamin or Radish. So um, that's, I think, something you have to speak to is what sort of a model are you going to be? Um, the other thing too is, you know, like right now, we are, pro I'm not sure, but we are probably talking to each other through Amazon servers, you know? So even as much as we think, you know, Amazon should, maybe change who they are and we could tell them what to do. In a sense, uh, we're very vulnerable because Amazon Web Services is apparently why Jeff Bezos is so stinking rich. Anyway, Jamin, you want to share about that, your thoughts? Where's Radish going to go? Sure, sure, sure. Happy to. Uh, I also see that Myra has her hand raised and uh, James, looks like you've raised your hand. Okay, very good. Um, so I'll just comment briefly and then let Myra and James comment. Um, so um, where I see this going is, uh, first of all, in the decentralized way. I don't want Radish to really be in the middle of anything. What I want is for uh, dozens, ultimately thousands, and ultimately millions of these conversations to just happen because there is knowledge of this net, this decentralized network that we're building uh, where people can talk to anyone they want and jump from conversation to conversation, et cetera. So I see decentralized as really the way to go. And then uh, what Radish might do in terms of development is to perhaps create like a search engine that would make it easy for people to make whatever simple or complex queries to find whatever conversations they're looking for to be able to plug into. And then the network of conversations itself would generate so many more ideas than we're able to generate in this one little conversation that we're having right now. A whole network of conversations will generate a whole really rich, deep vision of uh, where we can go with this. So. Anyway, those are kind of my initial thoughts. Just make it totally decentralized, not like a closed walled garden like YouTube or, or Reddit or anything like that. Um, but just humanity connecting via video conference and um, you know, sharing these conversations through whatever protocols we collectively develop around transcription and indexing and search and bots and AI and all this stuff so that the whole of it will work well, very efficiently. I don't think that's a complete answer to what you're asking, but those are just some initial thoughts to keep the ball rolling. Um, Myra, you've had your hand up, followed by James. Go ahead, Myra, and welcome. Good to see you. Hey, Jamin and Nolan, how are you guys? Nice to see you guys. <laughs> Congratulations again for making this, uh, this happen. The whole 24 hour block party. I don't know how you guys stay up for 24 hours. That's amazing. Um, I did want to share, um, I'm excited that I'm gonna be here talking in Spanish for the first time we we're doing a segment in a complete hour talking about this problem in Spanish <laughs> and hopefully other 
countries and other people from different languages start coming here also. Someone was asking earlier, um, how can we bring more people together? How can we invite people? I did want to share, I mean, we are all here by, um, by free will. We are all concerned about this problem. And we are not getting paid to be here. I wanted to suggest for everybody that is listening, if this is something that concerns you, if you are worried because what kind of home are we going to live for our kids, our grandkids? Well, you know what? Help and diffuse. Do network and diffusion. Go on, um, on Instagram, hashtag, tag people. Let your neighbors, your friends, do on, go on Facebook. There's just different medias that you can also help Jamin and Nolan to bring people together. Um, that is something that I wanted to share with each of you, that uh, that is an amazing work for you guys to do to, be, to contribute within this um, project that, uh, that Jamin and Nolan have. Um, and it's a project that we all are part of this. I mean, we have Dr. Fierson, which I was looking at a lot of his videos this past days, and there is a lot of people that wish they can interact with him directly and ask him questions. Well, you know what? Get on those videos, uh, post a comment in the bottom of those comments and say, hey, we're having a 24-hour block party. Dr. Fierson comes here in a frequent basis and he interacts with us also. Um, and it's just a suggestion. There's other people that they would like to interact with Dr. Sailesh Rao also. So this is a way to interact with them because in a way we are sharing um, their point of views regarding this climate change with veganism, with collective intelligence, with um, SRM. So just wanted to put it out there. And um, I believe uh, in the, Jamin, I believe in the Spanish segment, I invited our one of our gurus, which is a, uh, the first female guru that stepped in last year. Um, since our organization since 1948, uh, we've only had nothing but male gurus and she's the first female and she's vegan. And she's very concerned. I mean, she's a woman by nature. She's concerned about this problem. She's concerned about her kids. Um, she's gonna confirm to me if she's gonna be a part of this talking in Spanish. She's in Oaxaca right now. So if she can't, I will let you know so you can add her on the calendar at, um, at Radich. And oh my God, I'll be too excited to just listen to her. And I know a lot of people are also. So that's going to be helpful to bring other people in because a lot of people like to interact with her. Great points, Myra. Thank you so much. You know, um, there are so many great personalities and intellects and voices on the internet but it's so frustrating because you can't just talk with them right um directly and um uh, so that's you know a huge value add that we're uh promoting here is the ability for people to just talk with each other uh, you, i'm glad you mentioned dr silas rao in less than two hours he'll be joining us for a two-hour segment um on I think the first title is How Not to Go Extinct. Is that right, Nolan? Uh, mm -hmm. With Dr. Silas Rao. And he is committed for the next seven weeks. Every one of the next seven weeks, starting today, he'll be on for two hours from 10 a.m. Pacific to 12 noon Pacific time. And, um, you know, but then part of the big idea is that we get so many other voices, not just crammed into this one channel, but, you know, opening up on parallel channels. Uh, so that we can really open it up. And we'll, we'll get there over time. I kind of believe in sort of the slow food movement as regards evolving this. Um, that is so beautiful. Um, Dr. Saile, she had the chance of meeting Guru Lucy, and it's, it's just amazing. I, my respect goes for um, Dr. Saile. I admire the work he's doing. I mean, just bringing all, all of us together. Um, and I think his, uh, uh, his work is just amazing. I, I admire him to the moon and back because he's definitely doing a great job. Beautiful. Thank you, Marta. 
All right, James has his hand up and followed by uh, Emery. Take it away, James. James, you're, you're muted there. I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, I've unmuted you, James. Yeah, cheers. Again, nice to see you all again anyway. And um, I'll try and speak slower. And I apologize for my accent again. So good that, good to see you all and hear you all getting together. But uh, no, I was just in relation just to the conversation that was going there and because um, I, I missed a little of the start of the show because uh, the talk because um, you know other commitments but just in relation to drawing attention to it first of all anyway and in what in relation to what miles was saying about the just there about the first nations and they'd be very unwilling to share their stories you know that kind of a way like so um for drawing attention to it i think that kind of comes into it as well um in something that Miles was saying as well last week, the, the reflective little, the little reflective shields that he was proposing to, you know, sell to protesters or whatever else, or but that could be expanded on, and you know, it could be a protest banner on one side, and it could be a reflective shield facing at an angle to the sky, you know, but it could be a light protest banner, but it could be done up nicely with a, a reflective shield on one side and your protest uh, statements on the front. But one of the main protest statements to go with that kind of a reflection protest, we'll say, is to be, just basically put it on, on the back of it to, you know, reflect and pr protest, reflect, protect, you know, something like that. Like, um, but it'll draw the idea to people's, um, the reflection uh, side of it anyway as well. But my, going back to what Miles was saying there about First Nations not wanting to be really, or being really reluctant to share their stories. I, one of the other most uh, significant things about the First Nations and part of the story, obviously, and because, and, and more importantly, part of the reason for how they've persisted, you know, uh, it was basically that the, the most important rule was that they left the environment and in a fair, in a, a good enough state for the next generation, eight gen, or seven generations. Basically, they were saying like that it's not just here for us, and we mustn't just look after for us, and maybe for our children initially who are just around us, and they're all in our immediate. They taught seven generations ahead. So, taking on that, and their passion for their environment. Obviously, their passion for their environment would expand to their passion for the environmental situation on the planet. So, and taken from the fact that their of their stories that they're you know they're proud for their stories, um, we you like you could put it to them in a the sense like if if the information was broke to them, you know what this situation is good on ground level. If information is broke to some of the members of the you know the higher members of the different tribes the environmental crisis that we're in now like and basically we could put it to them in such a way that we now realize that their stories and their environmental values and their traditions and their old ways of living and they're living by the seasons and all these things are now what we most need and uh, we most need now and therefore we are now we're now, in a sense, is like a reversal of history. If you think about it, we know our the rest of uh, society, mankind, is coming out to the First Nations for help, basically. So we we need to stress that point. We're coming to them for help. Uh, we have situations that we, you know, Miles was saying, or somebody else was saying, maybe they have a lot of money and everything and everything else generated by their casinos, blah 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 blah. One of the main things and one of the highest uh, forms of counting coup in in a nation was um, to give what you had to those that didn't have it, basically. It was above right. Can you hear me? Actually, James, you're, you're breaking up a bit. Um, okay. But now you're back. 
yeah, sorry, someone just called there and um, I had to cut the call off. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you'll have to, you'll have to just, <laughs> that interrupted me there now, so you'll have to kind of give me a brief where I was there. Or what. Yeah, you're talking about the First Nations and how we're reaching out to them for help. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the beautiful... Oh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they're, they're, the most valued um, form of counting coup was to uh, give to those that didn't have it. You know, um, the, you know, the leaders or the, what were considered the chiefs of the tribes weren't, weren't, they weren't given the positions for bravery or any kind of acts of, of uh, any other kind of acts like that. Their most uh, uh, treasured form of, um, hu you know, humanity was to give to all those that didn't have it. So the chief was the one who gave the most to all those that didn't have it. And that was why he was revered as well, like, because of his knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so in that, taken from that spirit again as well, and we, we showed them that we are now in the situation where, where we are imploring them for their, their help, that um, I think that we can, we, if, if, we have a, if you have enough people that can talk to elders or who have connections with the elders or whatever else and, and explain the situation, and taking it from that kind of a situation uh, or that scenario, that I reckon, you know, they could um, be persuaded to, to, to get on board, you know, financially, sharing their stories, everything else, I'm not sure. Sorry. Yeah, no. you're, you're capturing it very well, James. And, and what it, it is that I've been saying is, trying to express is that we have to say we are coming to you for your culture and your governance. So in other words, even Radish would have to say, we're here to serve you and we're here to be led by you and your values and your culture. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Really great conversation. Um, I just got to note that Lawrence is going to need to head out in a few minutes. So Emery, if you don't mind being patient for a few, let, let uh, Lawrence chime in, and uh, then then yeah. then I'll go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Make sure I'm not muted. So okay, I um I uh, actually arranged a, a 10:30 call. I didn't realize how long this call would be. And uh, I had canceled one at nine o'clock and made it for 1030 today. But I wanted to say that um, one of the things I've been involved in for many years is actually um, medical technology and the idea to help people to save lives. And for nine years, I worked uh, for a company that I co-founded uh, with some colleagues from Microsoft uh, to to save lives and uh, it basically it was in the area of uh, disinfection and uh, sanitization for uh, equipment that's used in clinics and hospitals but, and currently I am the CEO of a company that um, the technology came from Europe and this is to help people that are addicted to opiates and alcohol and uh, it's a it's a amazing cure uh, it's been in operation in Europe for 20 years. Uh, it has a 96% success ratio, and they've asked me to bring it to the U.S., and so that's what I'm working on right now. So uh, where the Indian tribes come in is I am speaking with some of the tribes right now on that very topic. And so if I can come up with a name that can help anyone else in another area, I'll try to ask and find out. I don't have those meetings yet, but uh, what I'm told they will happen sometime in March, uh, middle of March. So anyway, but I do have to run and it was uh, an honor to be part of this group and to listen to everyone and, and hope uh, hopefully we get to, to, to meet in person and, or uh, talk again with you. It would be great too, Larry, maybe if we wanted to set something up even Maybe next Tuesday, those um, strategy circles, Jamin, maybe we can include um, some of your think tank individuals, Larry, that could participate, you know, at that higher level, like they are advising mm -hmm. the governments. It would be great to maybe 
just have maybe one person that represents that group join us um, whenever they have time. But I think that would be a next momentum sure. building thing. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know their schedules at all, but at right. the same time, I certainly, uh, certainly make that phone call. Awesome. So. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us, Larry. I'll be, I'll uh, speak with you later on. Thank yes. you everyone. Larry, Hello, Larry, thank you. Thank you so much, Larry, for, for joining us. Come back anytime. We'll be going for the next 20, 21 and a half hours straight today. So same link, come on back anytime. And of course, every Friday for 24 hours. And, and also as Dylan mentioned on Tuesdays, we also have the Solution Club that starts at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Happy to put you on the mailing list for that. If you get me your email address, Happy to include you in all those as well. I'll share that email with okay. Jamin. Barry, no problem. Okay. Perfect. Thank you again so much. Uh -huh. Thank you, Larry. Goodbye. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Aloha. Farewell. Bye-bye. All right. Very good. Uh, Emery's had his hand up, and uh, Dylan... Also, you got your hand up. I don't know if you were just holding it up for Larry. That was just for that was just for Larry. But um, I, I will say that um, you know Larry has incredible disruptive technologies uh, that he's been collecting for many years. Um, he's one of my wonderful mentors that we just work together on all these different projects. But I think that solution you did bring up would be a wonderful um, way of gifting these uh, communities, uh, these First Nations, because they're all still struggling with these addiction substances and i think that would be an amazing offering um that he's already of course communicating as we speak but that would be another way maybe melissa to uh bring about a conversation that helps make it a win-win just by connecting with us mm, beautiful beautiful love it awesome dylan thank you all righty what a great conversation and emery you've had your hand up thanks for your patience Go ahead, Emery. Well, I, I must say, uh, must, much respect for our First Nations. Um, I've, I've had a fair bit of interaction with uh, uh, some, some of my First Nation friends here in Montreal, at Kahnawake, and um, I have the utmost respect for them and uh, their lifestyle and their, the, the way they see the world. Um, my, uh, I had a comment to make, uh, which kind of has lost its context, um, you know, over, over, over time here. But uh, my comment before that I had in mind was, uh, was directed towards uh, the YouTube um, and how we're using the, the platforms. And um, what I wanted to point out was that uh, the tools that are provided by YouTube there, there are a variety of tools which aren't really being, being utilized to its full potential, such as the playlist, the playlist functionality there. Uh, it, can be, it can really be uh, um, advanced, you know. You could categorize a lot of different topics uh, under playlists and, um, you know, uh, make it easier for people to... Uh, zero in on content that uh, is is valuable and um you know uh, and you know in the past when youtube first started when they first came online um we were connected much more closely with with uh, our contacts you know we were able to see uh you know what the, their interests were and how compatible their their, um, you know, their, their interests were with ours, uh, with your own interests. And so you would, you know, develop a, a really unique relationship with uh, your contacts. And over time, YouTube has, uh, you know, taken these, these tools away, you know. So when you, you subscribe to someone who you determine to be very important, uh, to, and while you uh, see the world, you wanted to interact with uh, with with them. Um, you know, you were able to see what was going on, what was happening, how they were how they were going on uh, with with their direction in life. 
and um, you know we love to share our we love to share you know and um, I think that's that's what we need to do is share as as best as we can and utilize the tools uh, a lot better than uh, we've been doing because you know that's they've cut it away from us so we, whatever's left we got to double down we got to double down beautiful memory totally agree um and uh, that's a big part of what we're pioneering right here because if you think about these other social media twitter youtube facebook um None of them, I mean, you know, Facebook has video conferencing now, but uh, no one has set out other than us to create a social network of actual conversations through real-time video conferencing, combined with transcription, indexing, search, and ways of making all these conversations visible and accessible to everyone else. This is literally humanity coming together and talking with each other systematically across myriad topics, video conference rooms, conversations that, that progress over time. So a given meeting might happen once a week, um, another might happen once a day, and really hot topics like SRM um, might be happening 24 seven as someone uh, commented a few minutes ago. Um, and that's, that's really the idea. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there should be thousands of conversations on SRM happening 24 seven across the thousands of different solution areas and components of solutions, right? Exactly, David. exactly. But you, let's, let's say you take yourself, okay? You're on top of SRM, okay? Just for example, all right? Now you've got your channel. But so, so you're in tune with what's being developed, okay? And, and you may have looked at a, a number of things, a, a number of documentations or interviews or, or, or discussions that you've, you've come across uh, that would be very valuable. So why not have that? in into a uh, a video uh, in a playlist say here look what i found look and and and, and um you know your your contacts could come around and they could they could uh, mine all the gold that that you've uh, that you've come across and and the more people do that okay the more we can you know, understand what's going on, you know, because we can't all be everywhere and, and discover everything. But we could, you know, visit our, our friends, our, our, our contacts, and, and connect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you raised some really good points. Um, in fact, you know, with millions of conversations happening in parallel obviously any one of us there's only so much information we can hold and only so much attention we can give to so many conversations and so the big idea about all of this is that this network of humans coming together and actually talking with each other and working together in real time the whole network constitutes like this gigantic distributed brain where each of us individuals is by analogy like a neuron in this brain and just like inside my brain here there are neurons that only fire from time to time and they only work on certain kinds of patterns of thought certain kinds of cognition that they even participate in so that given neuron doesn't know what the other neurons are doing and it doesn't matter because the architecture is such that as a whole, my mind and body and self, you know, work by design. Um, so what we're talking about here is how do we design 
this massive cranium, this massive virtual brain with each of us operating as neurons within it, each of us knowing what we know and being connected to what we're connected to, but the whole of it working as this collective super intelligence. Uh, you, you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, James, go ahead. No. No, sorry, sorry. I wasn't, um, I was waving, my, trying to shoo my cat off. <laughs> oh, okay, well, well, welcome, Kitty. Welcome, Irish Kitty is uh, just welcome here. Yeah, she's no, just going to give me a massage. No, oh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> All right, come on, just okay. And feel free to mute your microphone, James, and then just unmute when you want to jump in. Hello, Kitty. <laughs> Oh, he's got headphones. Oh, he's got headphones, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe put the headphones in the cat. <laughs> I'm sure. No Sorry for this, the interruption. No, goodness, James. No no worries. And feel okay. free to mute your microphone, or if you can't do it, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to mute it for you. But, I'll sit down. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, so, you know... Um, so for me, the single biggest urgency and priority is building out the foundations of this collective superintelligence itself, right? I'm often tempted, thank you, Emery, I'm often tempted to, you know, well, let's talk details about SRM and all that, and we'll do that, and we, we do talk about uh, these details a fair amount. Um, but uh, if we're really serious about making this happen, um, we will um, uh, embrace that perhaps the fundamental prerequisite that we need to build out prior to making SRM happen is collective superintelligence itself, right? Figuring out how to put all these pieces together, the different social media pieces, like Emery and others have been, have been commenting. How do we make this distributed, right? What kind of tagging system uh, do we use for, for, you know, for openers, for starters, preliminarily, so that anyone who wants to start a video conference or a conversation, a recurring conversation, can do so and broadcast it um, so that the rest of the world can, can find out about it and participate. So how do we broadcast what we're doing? And also, how do we search? The, the flip side of that is someone who wants to hear what someone else is broadcasting. How do we search for those conversations? How do we subscribe to any conversation that meets a given set of, of criteria, right? So that's, that's all part of our, big, or, of our challenge here. How do we develop a culture so that all of this works, right? And um, so, you know. I want to add, Jamin, yeah. too. Uh, this, the, the fact that we're using SRM, um, it's just a great way to give us all that collective urgency to build the necessary uh, foundations for uh, collective intelligence. So it's a great, it's just awesome that we're leading with a project that's really unifying such a strong base of support and momentum. And that is crucial. And that's exactly what is happening. And I just, uh, that's what, that's, that's, that's going to give us the most momentum to build what we need because it's urgently needed to get SRM uh, going. So it's brilliant. Thank you, Dylan. I, I really appreciate your pointing that out. It's in fact, it's the combination of three big things that I see coming together that are really going to give this steam. Um, one is collective superintelligence, the other is SRM, with the urgency, necessity being the mother of all invention, and urgency being the mother of rapid invention. And the third pillar is veganism, um, as among many other wonderful reasons, the vegan community is very active, extremely committed as a whole. Obviously there's different people within that, um, and uh, fairly well organized and getting better organized and also uh, 
as a whole, the vegan movement and vegan community has just a really beautiful heart, compassionate heart um, for all of life on earth. So when I wake up in the morning, I got three big things on my brain, collective superintelligence, SRM, and veganism. And of course, we can add and must add to that list um, because one of the paradigms where I was several weeks ago that I've totally flip-flopped on is I used to think, hey, the way to really promote this and get it to take off is to make these fundamental pillars front and, and center and say, listen, everyone, you know, these are the pillars that we're building this whole network upon. And then I reversed myself a few weeks ago when I realized that um, no matter how convinced I may be or we may be of certain things, every individual is gonna come at this conversation or at this network of conversations from their own perspective with whatever set of priorities they're gonna have. And so I think the most powerful thing is to just leave it totally open do not lead with any given dogma or religion or philosophy or mandates or whatever, whether it's SRM or veganism or even collective intelligence itself, and simply focus on this medium of collective superintelligence. Let everyone come as they are with whatever they want to talk about. Um, and over the course of building out all these different parallel conversations, uh, everyone will be able to basically find their micro tribe, have those conversations that they need to have. But then over the course of having those conversations, they will find out about other priorities like SRM. And my faith is that the most urgent priorities like SRM will bubble to the top and that participants will likewise congregate around those most urgent priorities. So we don't really have to push anything on anyone. We open up the medium, make it totally open, and people will find each other. And the most urgent priorities will bubble to the top. Melissa has her hand up. And uh, thank you for the applause, Emery. And go ahead, Melissa. Beautiful, Jamin. Um, I just had an idea listening to you and Dylan talking. Um, yes. The beautiful thing about SRM, though, is it gives everyone a vision of hope. If I could use that word hope, I don't really like it. I like what Silas Rao said, which is faith. But it really is something we could see happening, and that is a solution, hopefully, for cooling the planet, which we all need, we, which we all know needs to happen now. Particularly now, we've heard, well, apart from Australia burning up, the Antarctica has had the highest recorded temperatures ever like a few days ago, I think it was like 68 or 70 degrees in Antarctica. Um, so here's a thought. Yes, the platform is open, bringing the conversations. We're all coming at this from different avenues and perspectives and with our different gifts. But what if there's this subliminal message, kind of like in the, in, in the past when you watch a movie, I think they were transmitting subliminally Coca-Cola bottles or the name Coca-Cola. So by the time intermission came, you wanted to go buy a Coke. And I really see the SRM could be the subliminal message. It's like, yes, artful activism. Yes, um, social justice. Yes, no more single use plastic. But that always popping up is SRM, SRM, SRM. So in the same way people have adopted this idea, this notion of sequestering carbon, why couldn't we get the message out there so that the message is SRM, not sequestering carbon as the main focus? That could be on a back burner. Or simultaneous. Or simultaneous, thank you, yeah. Yeah, totally, you're totally right, Melissa. It's. Um, it's like a unifying project, um, and I can't imagine, you know, now, now that we have a solution to some of these topics that I don't think like Extinction Rebellion, these other groups want to really tackle, because it's like, well, what are we going to do to our base? We're going to totally demoralize them by saying there's a feedback loop that's out of our control, right? I mean, Greta mentions it sometimes, but uh, I think the fact that we do have a concrete solution in the works gives that topic more of a platform to be voiced 
without feeling these uh, movements are going to be, you know, alienating their entire base into despair. So I think that's a huge piece that this can kind of bring about the global dimming conversation onto some of these larger movement platforms, right? Um, so that's how I see it unfolding. And, and uh, just with our collective group here, I actually personally yesterday, I endorsed uh, Ye Tao to uh, be on TED. I just endorsed his entire thing. I just went on the website and was like, hey, I want to endorse this gentleman, Ye, and want him to be on your next TED talk, <laughs> you know? And if enough people did that, for instance, they would get like, you know, a thousand people from our global collective here. I mean, they're going to get like, wow, we got to reach out to this guy and get him on our, our platform because he's wanted to be heard. Just things like that can be done with a, with a network effect, right? Um, so yeah, great point, Melissa. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I think that's such a great idea, reaching out to the TED Talks. I'd always wondered how they found their speakers. And actually, what could be really fantastic is having Ye, Damon, Guy McPherson, and someone like yourself, and I don't know, whomever, in conversation. Mm -hmm. Like a panel? Like a yep. panel could be fantastic. Great yep. idea. You got the fear, you got the hope, and you got the linking Jamin, and you got, uh, <laughs> what, what else do we fit here? I mean, that, that's great. I mean, that creates a very dynamic kind of uh, extremes of both levels. You got the extreme version of a solid plan of hope, and then you got the extreme version of the challenge that guy so eloquently puts together. So, um, and that's, that's always been, I think, the issue with Guy's work. It's been, you know, it's such a dire situation that he keeps voicing out there but it's like you can't add a solution to it and then it's more about just kind of letting go and just being being with it but now it kind of allows guy to get his work out there and it's not just it's all about doom or giving up it's about you know here's our challenge and this is our test as a species to get past that filter that comes for all probably celestial species that are out there it's like that massive filter that's going to phase intelligent life out or not if you just can cross over this this leap that we have to cross now which is basically like a type one civilization <laughs> you know so um i mean i'm sure we're going through a test that many other civilizations have gone through i'm, I'm sure they're out there right so we're trying to get over this filter and um and I think it's really, you know, we could put together something like humanitarian games. It could be like a game. It could be uh, like um, a way to get people engaged as sort of like even a competition uh, to get people, you know, going forward and taking these things to the next level and, and getting prizes, awards. I don't know. Just, just, I'm just fire sh shooting comments here. Yeah. I, I just so. want to jump in if I may just plant you know riding your this wave with you right uh, right um i'm just thinking of a corpus you know body a whole body so we've got yay's uh solution that's bringing hope or focus for positive solution we've got jamin who's creating a network um that's inviting everybody to come and be heard and to hear so that's great because we're bringing in everything so it addresses social justice issues etc um, we've got you who's you're very grounded and you have solutions as well. I love how you just leap in and go, Hey guys, I've got a gift, you know, cause we all need to be doing that. Hey guys, I got a gift for you today. Yeah. Here's that's what's that's about. Happy, right. So that's really beautiful because that's like the paying it forward. You're inspiring others. So that, thank you. That's beautiful. Lead by example. Yeah. Right. And then we've got guy, like you said, who's got the, here's the reality guys, but Here's something we can do about it. Here's how Dylan comes in. Here's the practicality, and here's Jamin bringing everybody in. And I think this could be really successful uh, as a um, recipe, you know, for broadcasting. Um, yes, with Block Party, but I love the idea of the TED Talks. I mean, I think that that sort of conversation could be had on many channels. Yeah, well said. Very well said. I mean. Um, even leading up to this conference, I've been reaching out to the Sunrise Movement. I've been reaching out to uh, just different groups that I just think like this is a no-brainer to get behind or just get exposed to it 
and just take it from there in these groups. I mean, you know, the Green New Deal, I have no idea how to get into any political campaigns, obviously, but there, you know, there's so much that can be done. It's just about, you know, it's like if we approach people with this, in a way, we're gifting the world with a solid solution to a challenge that people aren't even aware of. But it's, it's great to be able to enter into a, um, a conversation like, you know, by the way, I want to I gift the world this, this, this uh, open sourced way to solve this big challenge. And um, you might not be aware of the challenge, but, but here's what we've worked out that can really give us the edge that we need to transition everything we're talking about and all these different networks and groups, social justice, reciprocity. You know, if, if there's a way to unify kind of like a, you know, it's like, you know, as, as the earth is a spaceship or whatever, it's, you know, we're, we're just trying to fix a very core component of our spaceship right now. If we can get all behind that, then we can tackle these other passionate issues with a foundation of we have a habitat. Um, so it's like just, just simply prioritizing things, but everyone's where they're at. <laughs> passionate about their things sorry i'm rambling now oh no you're you're fine dylan R uh, <laughs> rambling welcome <laughs> and um I, I like the way that you both uh, melissa and dylan have been kind of co-framing this and um just to summarize my two cents on that is that see with srm srm is just like pure good news we can do this thing that if we just did the SRM um, alone as kind of like a single big first step, we cool the planet, we create a bunch of jobs, and in and of itself, SRM um, and this whole activity around it does not require that anyone else make any other changes, right? Um, so it's kind of a, in that sense, sort of an easy to sell first step we do this. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that and that would that would um you know take an extinction rebellion for instance, that would that would kind of calm I think a lot of people down as far as you know, they don't have to convince people to not fly anymore. I mean to, to, yeah, I mean we could be also honest with them, it's like we actually need people to keep flying. <laughs> so it's kind of like we're not showing we're not saying you gotta change anything right now. You could, we, we actually need you guys to keep doing this, sadly to say, for at least another ten years, five years, I guess. Um, while we're putting these mirrors into place. So we need, we actually need that. It's just a very weird irony that we have to almost convince them instead of doing some of the radical protesting. It's like, let's, let's give you, not to say a job, but let's give you a focus that you can put all that energy you're doing, gluing yourselves. Let's, let's actually start uh, getting this project going and then talking about, it on these platforms like they're doing great you know they're, they're all over the news it'd be great to have them actually talk about a project that is solving the that's solving the problem they have literally connections to the governments they're getting people to make uh, emergency declarations what, what what an amazing addition in their platform where they're saying like all right governments i know you're having trouble transitioning i, I know we're asking a lot for you to just give things up right now but but let's take a step back. If we can just get support for this one logistical implementation, I mean, that's going to calm a lot of the populations down from civil unrest mode. That's going to allow us to actually work on a solution together as opposed to creating more conflict that's already happening. A lot of rambling there, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, totally. totally. Um, I, I don't think I... I I know in detail what a trim tab is on a rudder, but the basic idea that was explained to me at one point is imagine you've got a giant ship with a giant rudder or a system of rudders that's steering it. And then on these rudders, we have these little controllable trim tabs, which actually help the rudder to move, right? So um, the way I see it is if you take all the actions and go upstream, upstream, upstream for the whole sequence of actions that needs to happen, all the dominoes that need to fall um, to make SRM happen, the very first step in my mind happens to be exactly what we're doing right here in building out the platform for collective superintelligence. 
so that then these sort of twin stories of SRM and collective superintelligence can travel, these twin memes that really go together and mutually reinforce. They need each other. Collective superintelligence needs SRM to provide the urgency, and SRM needs collective superintelligence to provide all the solutions to make SRM happen. So they need each other. And so as these twin, twin memes go out, <clears throat> we will attract more and more people like the 10 of us who are on this video conference right now um, so that our numbers can grow and we can um, over time, you know, split off into multiple uh, video conference rooms that are all interconnected. And, you know, um, someone like myself might, you know, bumblebee around from conversation to conversation and sort of help keep us all connected, not just myself, but anyone who wants to perform that function. Um, and so then the, these two, as these two twin memes evolve, one, hey, we've got the solution, it's called SRM, and two, we're building a collective super intelligence to make sure that it all happens, right? Uh, I think that those two paired stories can really work together uh, to build us, our community, into a critical mass that can really then start making some amazing things happen. One of the things that we can do is build out the, so the technological pl uh, platform to facilitate this whole network of conversations. And then as that grows, um, we will be generating real solutions. Let me give you an example of a real solution. A real solution could be a 60 second video designed to go viral across YouTube, Facebook, and all Twitter, all the social media channels that creates the whole summary of all this, of the urgency of the problem, the, the solution of SRM, the urgency of that solution, and the urgency of collective superintelligence to make it all happen. Boom, in 60 seconds, there's your red pill. Swallow it, yeah. jump, jump into the video conference and participate. It's that simple, that can grow, right? And then from that, from that one 60 second video, we might get a whole political campaign, right? That 60 second video might penetrate right to the heart of Extinction Rebellion and get them into this conversation. Imagine if right. 20 people from XR showed up. Totally feasible. There's nothing stopping them from clicking on the, this link and joining us right now. The one thing stopping them is they don't know about us yet. Right. right. Well, that will all change with that 60 second video. Now, prior to that 60 second video, we just need to have a bunch more meetings like this. Thank you, Emery, for the red pill image there. Um, by the way, a uh, quick time check. It's 8.59 over here on the left coast, Pacific time. We've been at this for three hours now. I, would, I need a break, and I imagine some other folks do as well. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? Uh, we can pause recording. Uh, people can still talk, but we'll, and, and yes, we'll still be broadcasting through YouTube and Facebook, um, but uh, we'll just pause recording for 10 minutes and take a semi-official break, but feel free to keep talking. Those of us who are on, I need to do a couple of things. And so I'm gonna go on mute here and- uh, Thank you, Jamin. It's been yeah. such a pleasure this morning. Absolutely. And stick around everyone. I'll be back in 10 minutes for a lot more exciting conversation and feel free to keep chattering it up in the meantime, everybody. All right. Thank we'll you. Pause recording and we'll be back in back recording in 10 minutes, but we're still live streaming for now. I'm ready to just jump in the car, Jamin, and just uh, you know get my camera equipment, get an interview done. And uh, I was just voicing, like I'm only four hours away from the A and uh, my in-laws um, actually live in Boston. So it'd be great to uh, do that sooner than later with him on his schedule. But I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I, I actually went to New York Film Academy. I have all that background and that's a contribution I'm, and a gift. I'm prepared to at least spearhead on the media side for sure. Um, and I was just voicing to the group and maybe in your background, Jamin, you probably have a few people that might be able to gift some of their time as far as uh, graphics or animations. Because I'm just seeing as a filmmaker perspective, visioning 
you know, let's, let's animate this solution being deployed. Let, let's have a, let's have like a, some amazing images of, you know, you're looking down through the atmosphere and you're seeing these mirrors just shining on the surface of the ocean and just seeing that, that beautiful thing take shape visually. I think everything, it, it's a lot of, a lot of the stuff that can be communicated is really just showing the beauty of the solution and showing it visually working. So that is a, such a nice way to get through any language barriers, just just to show a vision that and people we're can. Such a, we're such a visually <clears throat> oriented culture as well now that I think you have yeah. to have visuals to make something stick. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I'm prepared to do that, Jamin, and, and um, I'll probably email Ye about that at some point. Um, but yeah, graphics are going to be needed. Um, and again, it shouldn't take anyone, you know, a lot of time. I, I think um, there's probably a lot of, a lot of things that we haven't really tapped in yet um, in our network. So I, I was just mentioning to Melissa, if we could get like, um, even on Radish or something, if we can get like a list of, you know, everyone's skill sets that they're connected with or that they're doing and just kind of get a, a, a count of like, all right, we got a, got an engineer here we got a, an animator here we got a website designer here and you know just just kind of do a call to action and be like hey do you want to collaborate G give some of your time to this you know we can do an entire session just on that um just thoughts i'm throwing out there no i, I don't know love who's, it love yeah. it and dylan thank you so much for offering to lead the charge and head down to boston and <laughs> meet yay and colleagues there that is so cool do a little filmmaking magic, scale, scale model magic, you know? Totally. <laughs> Green screen it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that, um, I think in one of his last emails to us, Jamin, I think uh, Ye's doing some tours even. He's, he's like getting on some stages and sharing this as well. He's on a bit of a, a schedule, right? Yeah, yeah, so. he's got some conferences coming up late March and April, and um, you know, the, and this gets to a challenge that I've thrown down to Ye and Professor Guy McPherson. Um, that look, if we're going to try to do things conventionally, using conventional, you know, academia forums. Yep. Yep. Conventional politics, etc. The problem with the conventional right now is it is dominated by two things. One is greed and the other is delusion, right? And they, they go hand in hand because the folks who have amassed the most wealth are also the most deluded because they cannot imagine all of that wealth and all that privilege just evaporating, going away, or mm -hmm. much, much less their own life ending. So um, I've cautioned them to be, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Um, I know what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I, I just cautioned them to not have so much faith in the conventional and mm -hmm. to invest a chunk of their time in the radical, in what we're doing exactly right here, right? Because this is anything but conventional, what we're doing. Humanity coming together outside of any institutions. There is no institution overseeing this. Yes, we publish the information on Radish, but it's just a totally open forum that we want to totally decentralize, right? So we just create a culture of humanity coming together to do this. I want to remind everyone to please mute their microphones. Dylan, I'm getting a little feedback from you, but sorry. Okay, no problem. We, we just kind of get in the habit of muting and unmuting and all that. Um, Melissa, you got your hand up? Go ahead, sweetie. Yeah, I just want to say around language, like to, to the language we use. So I would say what I see happening is you are inspiring them to see things through a new perspective and to not use old pathways, you know, new synapses, new forward moving ways, new radical ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Les, you got your hand up. Thanks for your patience. Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, what I did is I uh, sent some uh, emails to some of the people I know and I uh, put uh, some information on some of the the climate change uh, YouTube uh, notifying them that we're doing this discussion. So um, with a link to the YouTube channel and the Zoom channel. And I put it on Radish uh, YouTube too, so you can see what I did. All right. Awesome, thank you, Les. Thank you. Jamin, do you have a WhatsApp group for this collective as well, or are we not using Facebook at all? Um, well, I do post from time to time um, links to what we're doing on my Facebook page. Um, I haven't created a WhatsApp group. I do text folks from time to time, but uh, need to get more systematic and organized on the whole social media front. In fact, volunteers needed for that, um, people who are really good at social media um, are absolutely welcome to uh, participate with us. And I've shared, um, I did a little posting on my Facebook. I've shared it to over a hundred um, kind of angel investor private groups that I'm involved with on Facebook. So I've, I've shared actually a whole statement um, and including a video from one of um, Ye's presentations in Boston that I found online. It was only a six minute video that just is perfectly um, spaced out for people to just take in like that. We need a 60 second version, of course, but, but I have been sharing that. Um, I've had over 500 views on my personal page on that. Um, and I, of course, linked in my up to give page on there as well. So I, I have been using that platform and I have been getting some interesting traction uh, just with Facebook. So could even be a, we could even I mean I could definitely um, uh, take another lead here and just maybe setting up an SRM Facebook page you know happy to do that too awesome awesome thank you and I sent you your friend, friend request as well <laughs> ah, okay. I'll, I'll get I'll get to it thank you <laughs> Yeah, I don't really do too much with Facebook these days, but I do use it to publish stuff. I'll tell you, um, I'm, I've just started using Facebook again just because of this project. <laughs> so oh. a lot of people haven't heard much from me. I'm just like, all right, here we go. Let's go. <laughs> you know? ah. So because I hardly post on there or you know, much of substance, they're like, wow, Dylan's finally saying something. <laughs> yeah, same. So, same. Yep. <laughs> I find that Facebook's a really great place for posting messages and um, Dylan or anyone else who has things to share, maybe we can inter share those on our own social media sites, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, et cetera. I'd be down with doing that. Hey, Amir, is that, is that how you say your first name? Amir Colossary, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's like right. Take, take a minute. <laughs> Emery. Uh, Emery. Well, Emery there we go. Us very good news and bad news. The bad news is <laughs> the current trajectory. Most of us here today will not be able to attend to our goals. Emery, are you there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, I shared that post with you in your messenger. Um, yeah. yeah, I got it. Uh, I, I just, uh, I was. I closed the page for a second there. Sorry. Yeah, I got it. So uh, we're connected. Right, right. What, what, uh, what do you think of that, that page or that post, just as an example of what we all could do? Do, do you like how that looks uh, with that uh, video? Which one now? The one I sent you in Messenger, just with uh, Ye's video and the, and the message along uh, with it. OK, so you, you, shared the, you shared the video. So, right. Yeah, I, I haven't. Uh, it's a six-minute, uh, yeah, six-minute video there. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to go through it yet. Uh, Got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with. I'm familiar with the project. 
So, gotcha. But uh, you can you can do a lot with these things. Like you can go live. You could, uh, you know, you could do a party. Uh, you know, invite right. Uh, lots of people. I've been doing that also. So. Right. Very yeah, cool. So, uh, you know, I connect. Uh, Want to work on uh, on a on a project? Uh, just uh, just uh, get in touch with me on Facebook there and sure. uh, see what I can contribute. You know how we could uh, touch base on that. Perfect. In fact, you guys are just giving me an idea. Um, think about all the people who don't know a lot about this. Um, their my their first step rather than jumping into a meeting where they're talking with other people might be to watch some content. And here's the idea that just occurred to me is we could organize meetings both during the Friday 24 hour block party window or outside that window where a host, um, which could be any one of us says, Hey, I'm going to be screening this one hour documentary that really nails it as far as, you know, SRM, global dimming, whatever. And then after the screening, we'll have an open conversation. Right. Um, <laughs> so I see some thumbs up. Thank you. Great um, idea. Yep. And uh, so anyway, and then that can bring people in and then the host in the after, after discussion can say, you know, great, you know, let's talk about this. What, do you, what did you think? Any questions, et cetera? And that can help channel people in to the collective super intelligence from observer to participant. It can be kind of like an on-ramp. Uh, Les, you've had your hand up. Thanks for your patience. Go ahead, Les. Uh, I noticed a lack of the, the ability to like type words or something like that on the Zoom app. And it would be nice if we had a maybe a wiki or some some place that we could like maybe uh, send uh, text messages uh, so that like uh, anybody here in the discussion could like be able to send like links that they found or verbal you know like written communication that would be helpful well we've got that with the chat feature here so here i'm going to just type into chat um for everyone to see i'm just going to type in hello okay so les do you see that where i just typed that in you should see your your microphone's muted but you should see yeah. how do you do that now so do you see down at the bottom of your screen um, are you on a, by the way, are you on a phone or a computer? An iPad. Okay, so um, maybe someone else who's using iPad can let us know. Um, but I'm on a computer and at the bottom, there's an icon that says chat. And it flashes every time somebody types something new. Um, and I'm able to click on that and then I can see what people have typed in. Uh, Nolan's going to check it out on the iPad. On an iPad, it's up at the top. Oh, at the top. Thank you, Miles. You're right. Okay. All right. So let's okay. check into that. When you see it, send us a message to all of us at the top there <laughs> so we know that it's, it's working. All righty. Uh, Emery has got his hand yeah, up. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention something. Um, we, yeah. You're, um, I mean, you're, you're streaming this on YouTube, you know, so like you have to be, I, I wonder to, to what degree now, I mean, you're going to have to watch the copyright issues, uh, I would imagine, or, or is there a way we could all uh, just agree to, um, you know, um, bypass this and collectively say that this is uh, Creative Commons and uh, we all uh, have have a release uh, to our, uh, you know, to whatever we provide uh, here together, you know. So uh, I don't For know. For educational purposes. There has to be a way that 
that we can bypass this clamp down by YouTube and, and the powers that always want to be, okay, to prevent us from, from uh, you know, connecting and sharing our, 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 uh, our things on the, you know, on the basis of some kind of a copyright issue. Yeah, well, um, you know, what's up on YouTube, um, we, we can totally share and, and broadcast and all that. Um, so I haven't really seen an issue there. Um, Les, you were screen sharing a minute ago, just so you know, <laughs> as, you were ex as you were poking around, but that's okay. And James has his hand up. Go ahead, James. And James, you're muted. Your microphone is muted, James. Sorry about that. Um, no, I'm just saying on, I have under the understanding that I have, we're all entitled to the freedom of speech and there's none of us here doing anything and breaking the law here. Like, so we're just having a conversation. So I can't see how anyone could say anything about that as regards to ideas that are going to be put out there or anything else or if anyone's worried about copyrights or anything like that. Um, unless they're infringing on copyrights, that, that's that's a different matter. But if they come up with ideas, no worrying about copyright or their, their ideas. I don't think we have time to be even thinking about that. Like, like as in worrying about our own copyrights of ideas or anything else like that. This isn't about profit, is it? Like I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw out ideas, and I know that look, they might not be the best of ideas, but I'm going to put them out there because if they're not out there, as you said yourself, people, you know, if the collective intelligence can't draw from anything unless something is put out there. So I will put in my bit, but I, under no circumstances whatsoever will I be expecting recompense for it. So that's all I want to say. Beautiful. Thank you, James. I, I think the comments about uh, copyright and all that were more for broadcasting stuff that's on YouTube uh, that other people have copyrighted or whatever, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about that. Um, and uh, your points are very well taken. I'm not doing this for any form of compensation, but just to save life on earth and participate with all of you. Okay, Les sent us a message. Um, thank you, thank you, Les. Les found out what to do. <laughs> thank you, good. Go ahead, Melissa, sweetie, go ahead. Hi, Amira, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> we haven't heard your beautiful voice yet. Just wanted to say hey. And also, there's nothing wrong with a little silence. Give us a chance to catch our breath mentally. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> well, we, uh, it's sometimes uh, we, there's like a lot of people that want to talk at once. <laughs> so now is your your opportunity, right? <laughs> There's a no end of a uh, of things I like to find out online, and uh, it's it's so easy nowadays. Although um, uh, it, it seems like uh, disinformation is so prevalent nowadays that um, you really have to be careful. You, you kind of have to be skeptical about almost everything that you, or probably you should be skeptical of everything. It's pretty hard to be skeptical of this coronavirus, eh? Hey, look. This coronavirus uh, has me bummed out. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there definitely is. Um, Apparently, there's a, a coronavirus, but um, the way that the media 
portrays it. And I think there, a lot of times they like over, they, they overhype it and make it, uh, make people afraid uh, of it, even like, you know, associating with other people in one, in, in, in that way, in many other ways as well, they, they t tend to atomize humanity. What's your primary source for your, uh, the info that uh, you connect with for this uh, Corona? What, what, what's your, your primary source? I don't know that I have a primary source, although I, I've been, um, one of the things that I've been doing is uh, looking into ways to build your immune system. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's preventing um, the problem rather than treating the problem. Uh, traditional medicine is uh, where they use, they use uh, pharmaceutical products which cause actually they poison your body when you take pharmaceutical products and they they euphemistically called it side effects and then when you you take a pharmaceutical product and you uh you poison yourself and they give they say well you have got you've got more problems so then they give you more uh, uh pharmaceutical products that cause even more problems. And there's people that are like taking 50 uh, pharmaceutical products on a daily basis and have all kinds of problems. And if you can, if you can get out of that, um, that cascading situation of, of bad health, uh, eliminate as many pharmaceutical products as you can and stay away from them as much as you can. You can preserve your health. And a lot of the nutrients that people used to get from eating uh, food, they grow, grew in their own gardens and, and even the foragers, <clears throat> you know, the, there was such a, of an abundance of uh, minerals in the soils, but nowadays we have factory farms, and um, and a lot of the nutrient value is sucked out of the of the soil, and then we have like toxins in the air, and it it all is a bad combination for your health when you when you when you grow crop after crop, the same crop over and over again in the same field, the, the, that crop uh, prefers certain nutrients and it pulls those nutrients out of the soil and then uh, fewer and fewer nutrients are available. So you, you eat uh, you know, produce and it doesn't have nearly the nutrient value it, it, that it, it used to have. And so then your body's, you know, you're, you're actually, your body's composed of trillions of cells. And 90% 90, 90 of your body's actually microbes, not even human. But we're kind of in a symbiotic relationship with them. So what we have to, what we're really doing is we're uh, kind of like growing it an organism in a petri dish you have to provide it the nutrients uh, that that are necessary for it to thrive and if you if you're missing key nutrients then you're going to get sick well nevertheless still very very frightening to me this uh the way that it's being trans transmitted and um you know the lack of testing that's going on. It's uh, you know it's it's just horrendous what's uh, transpiring here, and um, I think we're right. At, I think we're at the beginning of we're at the beginning of this. Not to say that stuff like this hasn't happened in the past, and um, you know 
It's just that uh, it seems like it's gotten out of control. It's slowly getting out of, well, not slowly. It's, it's pretty quickly getting out of control, I find, from what, from what I've been able to discover in my research. So, uh, you know, it's going to take one, one, one or, well, if it's going to take a few of, of these high officials in, in gov and government and whatnot, you know, some leaders to catch it for, uh, for it to really uh, sink in and wake, wake the bejesus out of people. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, my biggest concern with the virus topic is, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, industrial activity that's being uh, paused or halted in China, especially. And uh, I think I recall Professor Guy saying, um, if there's a 20% um, reduction in, in our industrial activity or the, uh, you know, aerosol masking effect, uh, you know, uh, chemicals going up or whatever, um, that's going to only increase the heating uh, exponentially, right? So right now they're seeing uh, stars in the sky in China. Um, the smog is gone, right? So uh, no one's driving cars. Uh, shipping is halted. Air travel is halted. Um, and that's a very large area of the globe that's no longer having that uh, blanket, right? So that's not to mention the economy as well. So having a recession right now, that's only going to, of course, speed the global warming effect. So that's, that's my only real bigger concern as far as affecting our time scale with um, the MIR project. Well, Guy put a real good video out. That was a good one. Uh, that was from uh, today or the other day. I just saw that this morning and... Uh, it's right, right in line with what he's been, what he's been saying. Good explanation there, Dylan. Yeah, I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. All righty, I want to welcome Jim, who joined us in the last few minutes. And also Ace, who's joined us from England. Welcome to you both. Uh, we're having kind of an open discussion here, uh, spanning the topics of collective superintelligence, <coughs> uh, solar radiation management, SRM, and other related topics. Uh, Jim, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, Jim. And Jim, your, your microphone's muted. Yeah, it's muted, but you can unmute it. There you go. I, I really wanted to come on today and offer a positive thought. Um, I um, was just, the thought occurred to me, um, um, why don't we all um, limit the amount that we will heat our, our homes just above the point that would allow to prevent for hypothermia? You know, why don't we wear our coats and our hats and our gloves when we're inside? I, I don't understand. We're so uh, addicted to the creature comforts to where um, I, I can only imagine that would have a huge impact. And why don't we just cool in the summertime to the point that would prevent uh, heat exhaustion? You know, wh why haven't we been um, forced into that kind of um, austerity? By our, uh, I, I understand that the fossil fuel lobby <laughs> has a lot to do with it, but you know, I, it reminds me back like when Carter was president back in the 70s, uh, late 70s, you know, where you know gasoline was rationed. You know, um, I can't um, other than imagine that that would have a, a huge positive impact if, if the word and message just got out to do that. And, and I, I apologize because the thought really never occurred to me because I'm so addicted to comfort. So I'll put that out for people's thoughts. Yeah, you know, we've got 
there's there's so many uh, different solutions um, that we could be focused on. Um, I'm going to put out a thought here, which is that what if we um, concentrated? What if we were to concentrate, just theoretically, on SRM and um, just laser focus on that? and building out the collective intelligence initially to be able to chunk out SRM into its different constituents because we could spend all of our time talking about different problems, virus, you know, energy use, all kinds of stuff, and we continue down the death spiral, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we all die um, of heat exposure, lack of food, lack of water, viruses, whatever, with the best of intentions, saying, well, what about this? Well, what about that? What about that? Right? <clears throat> like, you know, concentrating the rays of a sun into a laser beam. Um, I'm just putting out there, what if we were to concentrate on the two main vectors needed to to get us out of this death spiral as quickly as possible. Those two main vectors being collective superintelligence and SRM, solar radiation management. I'm just putting it out there as a topic for conversation. What if, what if we just concentrated on that? <clears throat> and then as I was mentioning several minutes ago, we could really foster these two twin memes that one, there is a solution to abrupt climate change a short-term solution, and that's cooling the planet through SRM, through increasing the planet's reflectivity. Um, and then, but to do that, we need to get so many other things to change in government, in the private sector, even the environmental movement. <clears throat> Most of the environmental movement still thinks that it's all about drawdown, all about carbon, all about greenhouse gas emissions and all that which <clears throat> completely misses the point of the, of the short-term urgency, that if we were to reduce emissions, just like was uh, recently commented by uh, Dylan and others, <clears throat> that if we reduce emissions, including particulate emissions, we reduce global dimming. We reduce this benevolent SRM, which was an unintended consequence of all these emissions, but nonetheless there, um, we could overheat if we if we reduce emissions in a matter of weeks in a matter of weeks prior to implementing srm so um again just imagine that we just laser focused on those two memes these two big solutions um of collective superintelligence and srm uh James, you've got your hand up, and I've also got a comment here from Ace in England. Ace says, the chance of global catastrophe this summer has risen dramatically. The coronavirus is killing Chinese industry, the world economy, and taking out global dimming as we speak. So the urgency in front of us could not be greater. Uh, James has his hand up, followed by Emery. Go ahead, James. Right. Um, okay, no worries. Exactly. I'm after sitting up now. So, taking on what you just said there, J uh, Jamin, I agree with you 100 and, you know, just 100%, right? Everything, right? So, we need to focus, as you said, like, and uh, look, I, first of all, I'm going to put out there, I'm qualified in nothing only as, a, you know, I'm a qualified in fine arts. So I'm, you know, that's about it. I have a good degree in fine art. But I will say I'm not an engineer or qualified or anything else, but I, as an artist and, and during my life in construction and everything else, I am, I suppose, a, a bit of an innovator, I suppose, is what I, I, I do come up with solutions to smaller problems. Well, the problems that I face. And I, I because of the, where I came from and where my background is, and I'll put it out straight out there, like I'm not by any means, I'm, I'm probably on the the lowest uh, level, lowest level of um, the pay bracket in society, basically at the moment. So anyway, I'll, I'll even say this: I'm on social welfare payments at the moment, and therefore I'm, I'm making another valid point that people on social welfare, 
even, as they're maybe considered to be or viewed to be um, a drain on society, we'll just say that even people from social on social welfare have a brain in their head, can talk and can come up with ideas, solutions, and not only that, just like people on social welfare, people in the third world, everything is, we're all in this together. So now taking on that, I'm just going to go into a few suggestions based on the conversations we had in last week's um, block party. And also I'm taking on the, um, the presentation by Dr. Ye Tao and also the presentation or the little video that we saw there near the end about the um the kelp farming uh situation the plat you know this so i'm going to go along anyway on this but just taking on the conversations the type of conversations you were talking about Jim. um we do need to focus the conversations but you as you said there's a myriad of conversations going on i want to go on so let's just say I'm giving a very, very small example of something that you said last week uh, during the block party. It was two hours, 24, 55 into the first hashtag, part, you know, the first episode. And it was just in, at that time you mentioned you, you, you more or less kind of slightly interrupted and but are distru- distracted by the um, seagulls in your back garden. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, it was a, I'm not sure, is that a, a usual sight to you, like seeing those seagulls there all the time fighting with the birds, the crows? Is that a, a, a usual thing you see? No, or, no, no, it's actually the first time we had seen it. That's why it caught my attention. So you, and that's why, that is why it caught my attention also, because as I said to you, I am coming to the realization of the severity of the situation that we are all in now. I now view life in a totally different way altogether. I see what's important to me and I see what is most valuable to us, namely the animal kingdom and the birds and, and of course, humanity, of course, but we're all in this together. Like, okay, there's coronavirus out there. That is a big problem. And it's just after entering Ireland yesterday, officially. And um, that's, that is a big problem, but it also stresses them in the state of the urgency that we are in and that we need to start representing the priority problem which is as you said solar radiation management because if we don't then what will happen will kill the coronavirus itself so you know what i mean we which is more important you know what i mean so focusing in on that there was another conversation um uh, i noticed a few ideas were offered right and suggestions and there was uh, about placements of mirrors and uh, other ideas of what were about um you know, the third world nations, immediate problems for them to, uh, are two are like, like islands in the South Pacific sinking, uh, you know, places like uh, being flooded and inundated at, as we speak. And we're just like, I spoke to you last week, only last week. No, first of all, we normally have an, an Atlantic storm, maybe two after, usually after Christmas around that time of, you know, maybe one before Christmas. That's our norm for the last 10 years, but that wasn't our norm before that. Um, when I spoke to you last week, we were in the midst of Storm Dennis. Now, it's put on the news here that it's a Storm Dennis. But we, I know it was a bomb hurricane out in the Atlantic Ocean, and it's actually a hurricane Storm Dennis, who should have been the proper title. Um, the week previous to that, it was Hurricane Storm Kira. This week, we're now in the midst of Hurricane Storm Jorge. So, you know, this is one a week and none of them, not, neither, neither one or the other, have given any country here, uh, especially directly across the Atlantic. They are now we're about the first to get the whip of it, Ireland, as it comes across the Atlantic from uh, the east coast of America. And we get the first whip of it here in Ireland. If we're lucky, it, the cold temperatures of the Atlantic and usually because this, you know, the um, stratospheric winds and everything is, and the, if it does, there shouldn't be uh, these blobs, so they're not, it shouldn't be where it is. It, the polar winds should actually be up passing um, more like Iceland and crossing into Scandinavia if they were under their normal ways, but they're not. They're 
looping all over the place now from and the cold pressure all that's been covered in America for the last number of months since before Christmas has been pushed down from the Arctic and I, and I, as from what I'm aware of has been pushed even as far as the Pacific uh, um, equator anyway which is something that's never heard of priorities they're all priorities these are the urgencies these are that all these events are what are shoving all these hurricanes in on top of Irish people now when they're English people and they're flooded out of it and again as I said there are people that are trying to fight to get the powers to be to do the right thing, but they're falling on deaf ears. And unfortunately, a lot of people who are fighting for the right thing are slightly misguided because this, of, of the misinformation. They're not getting the right information. If they want the right information, they need to come to this block party. And that's what I'm urging people, first and foremost. And secondly, regardless of all the other conversations and the priorities that might be on other people's minds, and solutions that might be on other people's minds. As you said, all those will be shuffled into other different conversation rooms afterwards. Priority, this is the priority, solar radiation management, okay? So, um, aerosol masking, we, 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 just, we all know what that is and the urgency is the cooling. So basically, we can't even tackle the CO2 until we do the cooling and then we can tackle the CO2 and then we can, uh, maybe even, Keep up, you know, with the cooling keeping up and the CO2 tackled, the level, uh, treating the oceans to the, you know, de acidify the oceans and reoxygenate them and everything else, getting that all sorted out. We're already in the process of restoring the ecosystem in that sense. Um, on top of which, the technologies can be worked on harder than to, for the CO2 drawdown. It's, if, it's the most viable plan I've ever come across, and it all starts right here with the priority solar radiation management so i suggest that all other conversations not not be ignored no by any means i'm not saying that nobody should be um throwing their um their two pence worth in here no everybody should be is entitled as you said to speak and i'm not saying that at all by any means everybody have every you know good suggestions including um you know as i said the likes of the poor people on social welfare and everything else so that's all i'm going to say about that one anyway so I'm going to just go back straight to the idea of like what getting back to Dr. Tao's uh, uh, presentation about the solar radiation management and taking on that then from what we were talking about last week. Um, I again I'm, I'm going to I'm going to borrow a phrase that Dr. Yeo said uh, that when he when he humbly said that he wasn't taking any credit for all this uh, proposal that he was putting up that he was using. The information that he gathered from other scientists and people so he said he was humbly standing on the, the shoulders of giants in in that sense and you know i'm 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 only going to take from that and say that what i'm what i'm presenting here as i said i'm not an engineer but what i'm presenting is based on those talks and i'm just hoping that at least this might spur the right talks so i'm going to try and share something here now um share uh, oh, sorry sorry no I'm not used to this technology you know like um yeah. Okay, James, you're kind of right. Are you there? Yeah, we're here, James. We're here. Mm -hmm. And can you see the image? Actually, no. Ye okay, how do I get that on then? I'm after getting it up in front of me, but um, so there's a there's a sh look for a screen share. Got there it. You, there you go. There you go. Okay. No, taking on both talks, as I said, Doctor Yato's talk about the presentation last week uh about the uh the solar radiation array and he was on about the uh, idea of anchoring them to the um the wind turbines and you know that are out or maybe positioned off coasts and what have you but um 
I, I, I looked at that and I, I also took into consideration the fact that he was also uh, emphasizing that the wind um, the wind uh, towers would um, also they also generate their own form of heat and everything else. So I suppose we don't need to exacerbate, exacerbate the, the situation anymore. So I suggest that you know that is a great suggestion, but without even the use of those, we could just use you know basically other forms of anchoring. And I looked into the idea of um, how um, oil rigs were anchored. Um, offshore and at in deep oceans, and there was various types of um, various types of rigs all over the world in deep ocean and offshore, and uh, you know uh, solid rigging, uh, floating rigging, and anchored rigging. You know, just they're the basic types. Um, yeah, and they're, you know they're they're capable of working in the deepest of oceans as well. So they're they're on a large scale obviously so i thought about uh, boys and i looked at that and i looked at anchoring systems and such and, and such, such like that like and i saw that nylon roping uh, uh, was kind of used as an anchoring system for a lot of boys and everything else to give them um allow them ease of movement and everything as they're floating around but um now taking on all, all that i'm going to, if you notice i i started this with a kiss at the top uh, can you, I don't know if you can read the writing on this, can you? Yes, we can. N the the smaller words are a bit hard to read, but the bigger ones. Okay, okay. Um, well, what I'll do here, so, is um, the large word, anyway, on the back, on the top, KISS, it's just, a, uh, it's just a method we used when we were in, you know, when I'm, when I'm working as an artist, and if I try to overthink a painting or anything else like that, um, you know, your mind gets crammed up, you... You, you you know you you lose your your concentration and your um, basically you lose your concentration. So we had the same kiss, which means uh, quite simply just remember kiss, which is you just say to yourself, keep it simple, stupid. You know what I mean? So yeah. just keep it simple. That's what I suppose say. But anyway, so I think in simple. Blah, blah blah blah. I think you might be able to read the top words. So the 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 boy that I'm looking at here, no, or that I. Sorry, no, for the crude drawing, I only done that last night and uh, taken in consideration because I was looking up stuff and everything else and I had other, other things to do. But um, the, given the boy situation, I'm just saying, so the top, the, the top part of the boy here um, would actually be in a globe shape, but the, it's a transparent. Um, we could use transparent glass or perspex, but so I'm suggesting, I'm not suggesting any materials because I'm not an engineer, so I'm just suggesting the overall plan of, of in a sense now i know that these boys are all over the all over the world already there's large boys of the so massive size of boys and they've all different methods of anchoring so if we just take the the main block anchor which is the you know for deep ocean and everything else we and with nylon attachings and the coupling on the top of this nylon uh, um on this top of this nylon coupling here um so if you look at the at the anchor from the base up, you're looking at um, the attachment where a docking, basically, is a docking uh, attachment for the main buoy, which the above from the docking attachment, everything above is a solid piece, um, which can be assembled basically. Now, the the larger piece here, the stabling ballast tank is a platform, is what I call it. Uh, in in the you know the large area, floating um, directly under the buoy. So that that basically I'm saying it's a stabilizing ballast tank, and it can be. Now I'm not sure how this would be working with currents, uh, uh, or how it would be affected by currents. But I'm saying it could be it could be in two layers within. It's hollow, but it can be in two layers within, so it can have the nutrients being fed up to a tank in the bottom to give it stabilization. And if near air is needed for ending or end, well, basically air could be pumped in the top to help with buoyancy because you would have to have concerns about future possible weight build up and things like that and uh, maintenance, obviously. Um, there would be attachments then to the side of this ballast tank then as well, which would be fed out to the tubes to feed the nutrient um, platforms that were in the video, which would help to grow the kelp. Now, 
therefore you're cutting out the basic uh, need for the wind turbines to be anchoring huge arrays off coast plus you can work in all sorts of different areas of the ocean and in, in particular the pacific the, the pacific where you were saying you need this array to be set out um, in the first place because of the extreme heat in the uh, in the on the equator so basically yeah once these maps are set out, we say four, you could attach whatever amount onto them as you want, and you could uh, get your kelp working and growing off of that. The whole, the whole solid system from the docking uh, attachment at the top of the anchor, um, the whole system, um, basically the mirror, which can be removed and maintained if, uh, if as necessary, there's a, um, a chamber then in an internal timber, an internal GPS instruments and housing unit then can be held in with underneath the mirror system itself uh, and any other necessary uh, technology that I, that I don't even have a clue about or, or, or I'm unaware about. But um, the internal timer, or there could be a control retraction device then below that. As you see there, the little coil part uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the buoy itself. Um, it's an internal, internally timer controlled. And just to double up for security reasons, you'd have it satellite controlled and radio controlled retraction device. So basically I'm calling a retraction device because uh, there'd be a hollow tube going down through the center of the whole entire uh, piece itself. And it would come out through the end of the shaft at the base of the unit where it docks with the anchoring point therefore the retraction unit can uh you know retract it, it, it want, when it track, retracts in the line the whole unit can submerge as it gets pulled down by the anchoring uh, the anchor at the very base at the you know seabed and when it when the whole unit comes down into the docking point it will it will lock in and um, basically, the, it then becomes a kind of a solid lock uh, attachment to the anchoring line, which is still nylon, so it'll be able to um, deal with cur underwater currents and such. And uh, it'll also, the whole unit will be able to avoid uh, stormy seas uh, conditions above, should they, you know, happen to uh, be in the area or whatever. So, um, yeah, the at, at the bottom of the uh, main shaft, James, main shaft. James, yeah, James, I'm I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, okay. Yep. We um, have a our next guest speaker. Can you? Uh, well, here I'll take it off of screen share. You can also do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I took care of that. So um, it, it being um, 10 a.m. Uh, a couple minutes after, um, we for the next two hours we have we are blessed to have Dr. Silas Rao, who will be presenting and leading the conversation for the next couple of hours. I'm just going to start a new re new recording here. No one else.